tons of carbon from the great Energy House to provide gives us that real opportunity to innovate much more quickly, bring things to the market. So the Energy Innovation Agency is really exciting development because it's bringing together partners from across the city. We're also trying to deliver more low carbon renewable energy here within the city. Now the Fuel Cell Centre is a 4.1 million pound research and innovation centre. We're very focused on green hydrogen, so we're working in various different projects on electrolyzers, which ultimately will help us generate lots and lots of green hydrogen, which will be part of our UK-wide net zero plans. We've got our community forest called City of Trees, with their aim of planting a tree literally for every man, woman and child in the city region. Mayfield was conceived in 2016 to redevelop 25 acres of land right in the heart of the city centre. It sits at the heart of a seven acre park. So the B network is, it will eventually comprise 1,800 miles of fully connected cycling and walking routes across the city region. It's going to cost £1.5 billion. It's a perfect option to tackle health, uh, inequality and of course pollution. The Green Revolution will help us reduce inequalities and we want the government to back our ambitions to tackle climate change through a new Greater Manchester levelling up deal.
Greater Manchester is the first city region in the UK to adopt an accelerated carbon reduction plan over the next five years. We're setting the standard for others to follow. Working with the government, we want to bring a London-style integrated public transport system to Greater Manchester, which will help us remove a million tonnes of carbon from the Greater Manchester economy over the next three years, achieving our ambitious science-based goal of a net zero Greater Manchester by 2038, 12 years ahead of the rest of the UK, will require everyone here to play their part. We're spending £80 million this year on reducing the carbon impact from the public buildings, but also looking at our 1.2 million homes and how we can retrofit those. You know, the opportunities that the facilities like Energy House 1 and Energy House 2 provide give us that real opportunity to innovate much more quickly and bring things to the market. So the Energy Innovation Agency is really exciting development because it's bringing together partners from across the city. We're also trying to deliver more low carbon renewable energy here within the city. Now the Fuel Cell Centre is a £4.1 million research and innovation centre. We're very focused on green hydrogen, so we're working in various different projects on electrolyzers, which ultimately will help us generate lots and lots of green hydrogen, which will be part of our UK-wide net zero plans. We've got our community forest called City of Trees, with their aim of planting a tree literally for every man, woman and child in the city region. Mayfield was conceived in 2016 to redevelop 25 acres of land right in the heart of the city centre. It sits at the heart of a seven acre park. So the B network is, it will eventually comprise 1,800 miles of fully connected cycling and walking routes across the city region. It's going to cost £1.5 billion. It's a perfect option to tackle health, uh, inequality and of course pollution. The Green Revolution will help us reduce inequalities and we want the government to back our ambitions to tackle climate change through a new Greater Manchester levelling up deal.
Excuse me, if I could just get everybody to take their seats, please. Thank you. We'll be starting in just a couple of minutes. So please come and take your seats. Thank you. Greater Manchester is the first city region in the UK to adopt an accelerated carbon reduction plan over the next five years. We're setting the standard for others to follow. Working with the government, we want to bring a London-style integrated public transport system to Greater Manchester, which will help us remove a million tonnes of carbon from the Greater Manchester economy over the next three years. Achieving our ambitious science-based goal of a net zero Greater Manchester by 2038, 12 years ahead of the rest of the UK, will require everyone here to play their part. We're spending £80 million this year on reducing the carbon impact from the public buildings, but also looking at our 1.2 million homes and how we can retrofit those. You know, the opportunities that the facilities like Energy House 1 and Energy House 2 provide gives that real opportunity to innovate much more quickly and bring things to the market. So the Energy Innovation Agency is a really exciting development because it's bringing together partners from across the city. We're also trying to deliver more low-carbon renewable energy here within the city. Now, the Fuel Cell Centre is a £4.1 million research and innovation centre. We're very focused on green hydrogen, so we're working in various different projects on electrolyzers, which ultimately will help us generate lots and lots of green hydrogen, which will be part of our UK-wide net zero plans. We've got our community forest called City of Trees, with their aim of planting a tree literally for every man, woman and child in the city region. Mayfield was conceived in 2016 to redevelop 25 acres of land right in the heart of the city centre. It sits at the heart of a seven acre park. So the B network is, it will eventually comprise 1,800 miles of fully connected cycling and walking routes across the city region. It's going to cost £1.5 billion. Pounds. It's a perfect option to tackle health, uh, inequality and of course pollution. The Green Revolution will help us reduce inequalities and we want the government to back our ambitions to tackle climate change through a new Greater Manchester levelling up deal.
Right, good morning everyone, and it's absolutely wonderful to see you all here this morning. Um, my name's Steve Connor, uh, and I'm going to be your compare for today. We've got a huge amount going on today, so it's really exciting. Um, I'm, as well as running a company called Creative Concern, I'm on the Greater Manchester Local Enterprise Partnership, uh, where I'm leading on green issues. Um, so welcome to our Northwest COP26 event, Power to the People. Um, we're being live streamed, um, and if you wish to um, tweet about today, the hashtag is hashtag COP26NorthwestNW. Um, there should be a Wi-Fi code, yep, there it is on the screen. Um, and please do take part in social media and ask any questions if you want, because we'll be feeding them through if they come in. Uh, I just want to say one very quick thing in opening up, which is uh, an old friend of mine, Tony Wilson, used to describe the northwest of England as second only to the Valley of the Kings in terms of its importance to the course of human affairs on this planet. Uh, and he used to say that, of course, because of the Industrial Revolution. And of course, the Industrial Revolution is where we kind of kick-started the climate crisis that we're in right now. So I always say to people, if we can fix this problem, then anywhere in the world can't put this on their too difficult pile. So welcome to Escape to Freight Island. Um, uh, this is at the heart of the Mayfield Depot development. You'll hear more about that from some of our speakers later. Um, it's uh, got a seven-acre public park, the first one for 100 years uh, here in Manchester, so that's really exciting. And it's a really sustainable development. Um, and, and so there couldn't be a better place uh, to be based today. Um, there might still be some, some sort of the odd whiff around of last night's dinner, um, but I'm safely, I'm, I'm pretty confident this is the coolest COP26 venue you'll find in the UK. So welcome to Freight Island. Um, quick bit of housekeeping before I hand over to Andy. Um, there's no fire alarm today, so if you do hear alarm, follow the instructions of the staff. Um, we've got a packed program, um, which should come up on the screen behind me any second now, but the morning is panel debates um, and lightning talks, and then this afternoon we've got some smart talks as well. So please do stay for the day, enjoy it. During the breaks, please do uh, visit the displays we've got out here so you can interact with more people. Um, and uh, I just want to say a big thanks to the team here uh, at Skate to Freight Island and the event sponsors who've helped us do this. So, uh, I'm gonna kick off our first panel, um, which is all about leading the change um, in terms of how we tackle the climate crisis. It's going to be moderated by my good friend Helen Pidd from The Guardian. Um, but before we kick that off, I'd uh, like to welcome the Mayor of Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham, to say hello to you all today. Andy, over to you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks a lot, Steve. Morning, everybody. How are we doing? Are you okay? Yeah. We're ready for a, a really good event. Welcome. This is one of my favorite places in Manchester. I'm known to be here quite a bit, not always for uh, business conferences uh, like this. It's a fantastic venue, and thanks, everyone. Uh, escape to Freight Island for, for hosting us. I, you know, we are the home of 24-hour party people, and you know I can spot a few of you out there. I, I, you know who, who you are. We like to bring a bit of energy, a bit of life to things, don't we, Steve? That's true of your, your end of the M62 as well. We are known for, for having a good time, and I think we need to bit of, be, bring a bit of energy to COP26, don't we? Do you feel, are you feeling that, a bit of positivity? We need to connect it a bit more to, to people. And I'm hoping you, you can help us with that today because literally from this event, Steve and I will be heading up to Glasgow and we want to take your voices, what we hear today, up the road and get your voices heard. We've been hearing from the billionaires. They've been flying in in their private jets uh, to, to Glasgow. Um, my kind of feeling about that is, when you pay your tax properly, we'll listen to what you've got to say. But until then, you know, maybe we need to hear a bit more from a few ordinary people about how the drive to net zero can change people's, people's lives. And I think the second week of COP has got to be all about that. Four days to go. Let's kind of get voices of ordinary people into, into this debate and get the right outcome at the, end, at the end of the week, rather than being sort of told from on high how, how it seems. Let's then root, let's root COP26 in the real world and show how the drive to net zero can improve people's lives, can lower the cost of living uh, for people, rather than be something about cost and inconvenience, which is, I think, what they're picking up so far. I think we in the Northwest are really well placed to show how this can be a drive to make life better for people. Steve's got an amazing project 
in the Liverpool City region that we want to showcase this week at COP26, a tidal barrier across the Mersey, could heat every single home in the Liverpool City region if built. That is a fantastic example of how the drive to net zero could improve people's lives. Here in Greater Manchester, we have a plan to build the country's first and largest carbon neutral public transport system. And we've got a plan to do that within a decade, crucially with London level fares. Again, that is a tangible example of how the drive to net zero can make life not just greener, but fairer as well. Can climate justice bring social justice as well? We both believe that it can, but we both need your help to prove that, to prove that point, that here in the Northwest, as we go towards this, this change that we're going to have to bring about, 2038 in our case, for a net zero Greater Manchester, 2040 in Steve's case, we want to, to show that that 20-year journey won't just make us greener, it will make us fairer as well. And if we can prove that to people, then I think the public of the Northwest will start to, to buy into this. And I think we've got all the assets. We've got all the assets here. We've got the geography that will allow uh, Steve to do what he's doing there, but also the hydrogen project that you might hear about uh, today that will link Liverpool city region with Greater Manchester. We've got that geography, if you think about the potential for wind as well. We've got that industrial heritage. You'll hear about a green hydrogen cluster in Trafford today. You know, that expertise is there. It's still in our great universities. And they are massively knitted into what we're, we're trying to do. We've got the ideas, but we've also got the people. That they're our greatest asset. And if we can connect them to this, I think they will buy in. And I think we can become genuinely a place that is a center of excellence when it comes to the green economy, but also a place that is using the drive to net zero to build a more equal society. And that can set the north west of England apart. That's the message I think that we need to take up to COP uh, later today. The northwest of England is ready to lead this revolution. We led the first, as you've just heard. We are now ready to lead the next, but this next one needs to make people's air cleaner, give them more livable communities, better lives as a result of it. That's what we're going to be all about here. We hope you can give us your ideas today as to how we get there. Let's, let's show that we're ready to lead this uh, revolution and a revolution that's going to bring, as I say, climate justice and social justice together. There's nowhere better than the northwest of England to show that that can be done. So thanks for coming, everybody. Have a great day this morning. But give us those voices, those ideas, that energy from this room, and we'll take it straight up the road to Glasgow. Thanks very much indeed, everyone. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name's Helen Pidd. I'm the Guardian's North of England editor. I lead a small team of reporters um, here in Manchester, the Guardian's original home. We're running very short on time, so I will skip the intro I was going to do and just say I'm really excited about this session because I think like a lot of ordinary people, not too long ago, things to do with the environment, I'd kind of mentally filed under important but boring and doesn't really affect me. And I've really changed my attitude to the point that I'm on a waiting list to try and get my house retrofitted at the moment. But the waiting list is so long that I could be waiting many years. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to introduce the panel. They're going to do about five minutes each. Hopefully, we might be able to run on an extra five or ten minutes from what we'd planned to get a few questions in. But what hopefully the panel will be doing is giving us a, an insight into the really practical steps, the things that are already underway in our region in order to make it cleaner, um, more environmentally friendly and, and ultimately a better place to live and, and do business. Um, so the panel here today, we've got Steve Rotherham, the mayor of the Liverpool city region. We've got Sarah Kemp, who is the CEO of the Lancashire Enterprise Partnership. We've got um, Lord Inglewood, we're allowed to call him Richard though. Um, he is the chair of the Cumbria Local Enterprise Partnership. We've got Joe Manning, who's chief executive of the Cheshire and Warrington Local Enterprise Partnership and Andy Burnham, the Mayor of Greater Manchester. So I'm going to hand over to you, Steve, first to tell us um, a bit about, I think, offshore winds and tidal power. Thanks. 
Thanks, Helen. Um, I'm, first of all, what a great venue, a great introduction by Andy. Um, obviously, we're taking climate emergency so seriously, we haven't even provided heat for you today. <laughs> so, the, um, the, the coat's staying on. Um, <laughs> when I was a kid, I used to watch uh, telly programmes, and it was David Attenborough even back then, and he used to describe how we were killing the planet, we needed to do things differently. And not a lot of people actually thought that that was going to happen soon. Fast forward about 20 or 30 years to the generation of today, and the kids know that we need to do something. And so that's what COP really is an opportunity for us to do now, to go down and to give hope to those kids that we will act. And of course, people like myself and, and Andy and the other Metro mayors and leaders locally will do what we can do. But globally, leaders need to step up to the plate. And it's no good, Boris Johnson, in all honesty, giving a very good speech when me and Andy were at the Global Investment Summit, where he identified some of the things that we need to do to cl tackle climate emergency, but then just rehearse a sound bite with no delivery. So we're going to be holding those leaders feet to the fire and telling them what they can do to help us to deliver on that agenda. And first of all, high net, high net's being mentioned, but I, I think it went pretty much under the radar uh, with some of the, the media locally. I was a bit disappointed that there wasn't more of a song and a dancing about it because this could be huge for us. Now, there'll be people here who understand hydrogen better than me. And there's an argument, isn't there, about blue hydrogen and its production. But what we're doing now is to provide the infrastructure so that we can move over to green hydrogen when we can produce it in the volumes that we need to. Hence, the Mersey Tidal project and its importance. But we shouldn't let perfect be the enemy of good. We need to do what we can do now so that we can build that network, that infrastructure, to move over, hopefully seamlessly, when we, we, we get um, green hydrogen. And we're doing things very, very locally that I think will improve what we can offer um, young people in their hopes and desires for the future. So for instance, I don't know if you saw it on the screen, but we've got something called the Community Environmental Fund, where we're educating kids about biodiversity. Um, and, and we've got beehives and, and wildflower meadows and all that sort of stuff. And you might think, yeah, but that's not going to change the planet. Actually, we can't just change it from the top. It needs to be top down, but bottom up also. And we're doing things in our area that I think will be hugely attractive for investment from the government and from businesses. But we all need to play our part. And um, uh, we'll, we'll say much more about our plans for transport. There was a thing on, on there about um, glass futures, decarbonising energy intensive industries, hugely important to us if we can do that. A retrofitting that me and Andy are doing, we can take 30% of the carbon out of our local areas just by giving people better homes to live in and also tackling uh, energy poverty at the same time. So not allowing fuel to escape through the walls and windows and doors and roofs, but actually to, to bring those costs uh, of heat in those homes down. So we've literally got a fantastic offer working with Cumbria, working with Lancashire, working across the Northwest with Cheshire. We've got probably the most important set of carbon reduction initiatives in the whole of the UK, and that's what we'll be going to Glasgow on a train to do. Thanks, Steve. Um, over to you, Sarah. Um, you're going to tell us about manufacturing nuclear and onshore wind in Lancashire, I think. Thank, <laughs> thank you, Helen. Good morning, everybody, and it's, it's great to be here with you today. So I think it's fair to say that the sort of excitement and enthusiasm you, you felt from Andy at the beginning, we share that as well in, in Lancashire. And we've got a very uh, diverse energy and low carbon sector with significant strengths in the large scale renewable sector, nuclear and the large energy supply industries. 
as well as a, a whole range of subsexual strengths in their own right, which, which present a compelling offer. But when you combine that with the strong manufacturing and engineering heritage of Lancashire, the sort of technology integration capability and a very significant innovation asset base, as a county, what this does for us is translates, translates into formidable potential in terms of contributing <coughs> to those net zero targets. So that, that capability for us, and one of the things that really excites us, is not just about uh, being able to facilitate the decarbonisation of our businesses, public sector and communities, but it's, it's the ability to provide the technology, the expertise and the capacity as well um, for the deployment of energy and low carbon technologies. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about that today, um, if I may. Um, so we have about 50, uh, sorry, 5,200 businesses employing about 40,000 uh, workers at the moment. Uh, and although, uh, particularly in our low carbon and, and energy industries, they were probably one of the least affected sectors of the pandemic. Nevertheless, we felt it was really important that we understood what more could be done uh, in terms of the growth of those, those sectors. So last year, we convened a group of business leaders uh, who looked at the opportunities and challenges uh, that we were facing, uh, representing all the different subsectoral uh, and, and sector strengths across the, the county. And what they were able to do is give us some really uh, specific insight and real-time evidence as to what they need in, in their industries which meant that we could be confident that the interventions are relevant and that we have impact at scale to unlock that low carbon growth potential. So what was really interesting in coming up with those, those interventions were there were a bit of a, a, a split between what could be done nationally, what could be done locally, what was policy and what was fiscal. Um, and there was a lot of um, focus on the policy side of this because um, if there were certain policy changes at a national and translated to a local level around things like carbon taxation and planning and uh, landfill tax and waste, etc., actually businesses uh, would have the ability to grow without needing some of the fiscal uh, interventions. So um, I'll just talk to you about a couple of programs, if I may, um, that came out of uh, on the back of that work. So. Some of the, the barriers to growth, and particularly for our SME sector, which is very strong and very, very vibrant, was about the um, ability or inability to be able to demonstrate some of their retrofitable technologies in existing biz businesses, um, how difficult it was to commercialize their R&D, and the challenge of finding the right skills uh, in the right capacity uh, for their businesses. So uh, one of the projects that uh, we, we kick-started last year with uh, the East Lancashire Chambers of Commerce is a project that we call uh, Lancashire Centre for Alternative Technologies, or we shorten it to REDCAP, which is really a partnership between local and regional innovators so that we can con conceive and develop that pathway of support that's bespoke to individual businesses. So we have about 650 low-carbon tech businesses um, operating in Lancashire plus dozens of others, well, hundreds of others <coughs> in the aerospace, also mostly the manufacturing sector, who can also um, um, manufacture components. Um, and what we were able to do is put some of the Getting Building Fund in the, under the Green Growth Priority to fund REDCAT. We have about 100 companies in the pipeline, um, of which the first tranche is 13 companies who are gonna benefit through going through that program. So what we're doing is trying to address some of the constraining factors uh, things like access to capital investment, early product development, prototyping, demonstrating uh, the technology. Um, so we've got 13 companies running through at the moment, of which nine will probably benefit directly from funds. But what's really interesting, we've just started this program, uh, but we've already leveraged in four times as much funding as we put in to, to fund the program uh, at the beginning. So the kinds of innovations that the, the SMEs are engaged in are things like next generation batteries, waste to energy, climatic sensors, bacterial waste treatments, biodegradable packaging. But the aspiration is to create that test bed within the ecosystem to fully support the development of the supply chain. And then one, one last one for me about skills. So the LGA uh, published a report not very long ago saying that Lancashire had the uh, highest UK potential for new low carbon roles per head. But our businesses really struggle to access a workforce with the skills necessary uh, to realize their growth ambitions. So we got together with the Work Foundation from the University of Lancashire, really got under the bonnet to understand what the challenges were um, so that we had the evidence we needed to develop the local skill system. Um, and we did find that about 47% of our businesses find it difficult to recruit staff, um, a third uh, for, for specialist skills. 
And we found that actually maybe 80% of them were delivering in-house training, which is not a bad thing, but two-thirds of that because they couldn't find the skills provision uh, through external provision. About a third of them, though, were only a third of them were engaging with schools and colleges for career activities for children, and only a third uh, engaging with stakeholders in the skills system. So we've taken that knowledge and we've fed that into a number of programs now. So we've got a low carbon skills academy with the chambers working with the FE colleges. Uh, we've got uh, our businesses engaged with the careers hub and the enterprise advisor network. Uh, and we're making better connections through the technical education vision and, and, and developments, including the launch of the new T-levels and apprenticeship standards. So, excuse me. So a plethora really of programs and, and initiatives. But I think for us, the, the excitement in summary really is about that homegrown decarbonization technology. Two thirds of those businesses are exporting, so fantastic potential for future growth. That development of the low carbon Northwest um, cluster, really important. Um, and being able to influence users with different choices around low carbon options. And, and importantly, creating jobs at the forefront of the green industrial revolution. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so, Richard, over to you. Tell us about Cumbria. What's going on? Yeah, can you hear me, first of all? Can you hear me out there? It's wonderful. <laughs> um, I will say, I was, I was thinking when I came back from COP26 at the end of last week, that in order for this to succeed, a number of things have got to come together. The politicians have got to get the right policies. Uh, on the ground, we've got to get the right infrastructure in place. We've got to find the finance to enable it to be achieved. And finally, and most important of all, and this is, I think, the real lesson, we've got to get buy-in from everybody, to each person to do their own little bit to try and take us towards net zero and decarbonize the world we live in. Now, as, uh, as, as, as she said, I, I, I come from Cumbria, which I christened some years ago, the north of the north. We are an integral part, both of the north of England and the northwest, and also, incidentally, part of the borderlands cross-border uh, entity. Um, now, while you down here, what I call, might call this, forgive me, the south of the north, uh, <laughs> you have more people and more money, we actually have roughly 50% of the surface area of the whole of the northwest of England. And in many ways, we complement you down here. Now, obviously, as we all know, uh, two of the themes of COP26 are clean energy and uh, it's yin-yang partner decarbonization. And I believe that we in Cumbria have some significant contributions to make to the wider Northwest initiatives in this area. Now, perhaps most well known from, about Cumbria is uh, Sellafield, maybe some would say most notorious. But of course, the nuclear industry, while much of it is up there, goes much wider and spreads across the whole of the Northwest. And we are, I believe, an important element both technologically and academically part of the Northwest nuclear cluster. Now, in particular, we are now the only site from the Northwest left in the selection process for the STEP nuclear fusion prototype, which is part of the road which is going to lead to a different and cleaner nuclear future. And I believe that inevitably is going to come. And our friends uh, and, and allies in the Northwest have supported the Cumbrian bid, and I would very much ask you and urge you to continue with your wholehearted support for this, not least because it'll have ripples across the whole of the Northwest. And certainly as an individual, securing this project is the big current priority I have as chairman of the Cumbria LEP, because it offers all sorts of potential for green energy for generation in the future, and it's not in simply production. It's also in the IP and the technology and the commercial opportunities that presents for all of us. Secondly, out in Cumbria, we have a large amount of uh, offshore wind generation, and we are one of the centers of that aspect to green energy generation. Indeed, until a few months ago, we had the biggest offshore wind farm in the country off Barrow, but I'm afraid to say the, the Northeast have managed to build a, re a bigger one recently, so we must try and challenge them. And again, the point about these initiatives is that there is technology and IP and commercial opportunities that are derived from them. Um, finally, the other side of the argument is decarbonization. And this is something where I believe that in Cumbria we've got a great deal to offer because we have 
as I touched on, compared to you all down here, rather more open space. And that open space provides all sorts of potential for forms of natural capital and natural cleanup. And if we can get this developed in a sensible manner, respecting the environment and all the other considerations, I believe we can play a big part in that aspect of the new green world we are moving into. But I would just add a rider that its contribution cannot be achieved unless proper financial recognition is given to those doing it. And in turn, that will help underpin the prosperity of our part of the Northwest and with it, the Northwest as a whole. And with it, I hope, garnering the support of all the people in this area so that we in the Northwest can take our rightful place, as Steve, I think it was, was saying, as part of the forthcoming next industrial revolution. Thank you. Um, Joe, excite us. What's going on in Cheshire? Thank you. Um, well just, just building on that point, I, I really believe in the Northwest we have the potential to lead the green industrial revolution. Uh, and I think that for three reasons. The first is we have the vision. The second is we have the leadership. And the third, as we've already heard, is we're acting now. And I'll just tell you a few bits about what we're doing in Cheshire and Warrington. Um, our vision is for a sustainable, inclusive, and healthy recovery from COVID-19. And through that, we believe we can be a leader in net zero technology. And we know we've got the responsibility to act. Uh, Cheshire West and Chester alone is uh, in the top five emitters in the UK by local authority areas. And all our unitary councils have now declared a climate emergency and set ambitious uh, carbon reduction goals to go faster than the net zero target at a national level. Because of the emissions in Cheshire West, a lot of our efforts are focused around Ellesmere Port on the south bank of the Mersey, the home to a large oil refinery and lots of energy intensive industries uh, from cement making to glass manufacture, which is not normally everyone's uh, image of Cheshire. But this industrial area is home to 24,000 jobs, and we think by leading the net zero revolution, we can create another 11,000 jobs locally. And we want to look at decarbonization for, across heavy industry, to our agricultural economy, to our natural environment, as we've, we've already heard, and in all sectors of our economy, including housing and transport as well. And our vision is to create these green jobs for the future through doing this, whether it be the chemical engineers in Ellesmere Port, of the jobs in housing retrofit, or leading the way in data-driven food and farming. In terms of leadership, we've already talked about the importance of strong political leadership, and I think we have that in Cheshire and Warrington. Alongside that, I'd like to emphasize the importance of business leadership as well. We've established a sustainable and inclusive growth commission with our business leaders, uh, and that's looking at a wide range of issues. And through that, we've also established a billion pound pipeline of potential schemes that could be invested in and those conversations at COP about bringing private finance and public finance to bear in job creation. Um, colleagues from EA Technology are working on that and they have a stand here today if you'd like to hear more about that pipeline of investments. Again, we think those investments can create a significant number of jobs in the green economy. At the moment, our, our estimates are about 30,000 jobs if we were to secure that full pipeline. And then finally, the importance of taking action now, action rather than words. Um, we've already heard about HiNet, and I agree, we should be making more of a, a song and dance, if you will, about the potential of HiNet to really decarbonize a lot, of our, a, a lot of our energy production and our heat in the Northwest. The estimates are that HiNet <coughs> by 2030 could be taking the equivalent of four million cars worth of carbon dioxide out of the economy. That's a huge potential, and we can move from blue hydrogen to green hydrogen as well. The University of Chester is developing plans for an academy to make sure that people locally can get the skills needed around high net. And we have other schemes as well, carbon capture and storage at Tata Chemicals in Northwich. Um, Cheshire has a long history of salt production dating back to the Roman times. And I'm told that Tata Chemicals will be able to make a carbon neutral uh, sodium bicarbonate uh, which is basically a carbon neutral baking soda. So uh, it will take us one, one step closer to uh, carbon neutral cakes if we can just get the rest of the production sorted as well. Uh, and in transport, we have exciting schemes too. Warrington secured further funding for the bus network. Cheshire East Council is doing really great work around uh, decarbonizing its fleet of transport as well, showing that the public sector can act. And then in the private sector, Stellantis has confirmed that Vauxhall will be making 
their uh, electric vans again at the Ellesmere port site. So some fantastic things happening locally. Um, but if I can, I'll just leave you with the point of us collaborating across the northwest. Um, one of my favorite views in Cheshire is at the end of a sandstone ridge through mid Cheshire. And you come to a point at Helsby Hill where you can look out across the Mersey uh, and look towards Liverpool, towards Manchester and Warrington. Um, you can't quite see Lancashire and Cumbria. But I think what you do certainly see is the scale of heavy industry that we have located in the Northwest. That scale is the challenge we have to decarbonize, but it's also the scale that gives us the opportunity, as others have said, to really lead the green industrial revolution. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Um, Andy, would you mind if we went straight to a discussion? Because you no, already no, outlined what's have. going on in, in, no in Greater <laughs> Manchester. I mean, I think we've heard some really interesting projects that are going on, but. Tell me, Andy, first, like, what's stopping you from going further? Is it, is it the government? Is it a lack of skills, people? I said at the start, I've got a drafty Victorian home. I'd love to get it retrofitted, but there's a massive waiting list. There's not enough people to do the jobs. So do you want to start first, and then all of you want to just chip in briefly with what's holding you back, the barriers? It's, it's a bit of all of those <coughs> things, Helen. It is funding, as Steve said, but it is also uh, skills. You know, there is a, a, an urgent need for skills in the green economy. And yet the way we run skills in this country doesn't allow us to move as quickly as we should. I guess one thing that you unite everyone on this platform is more devolution of, uh, of, of control over skills so that we can quickly match the change in the economy, particularly the green economy, to our colleges and then what comes, what comes up. I mean, I think just to reflect on what we've heard, it's brilliant actually that you've got one Northwest on this stage and you know, we're the people that will make it real, aren't we? You know, you hear these high level messages from COP, all the things you've heard about make it real for people. Buy-in was the word I heard uh, Richard use, and I think it's the right word. It's, it's about kind of connecting it to people. Net Zero Northwest, I'd recommend to you all as an organization that has shown the jobs opportunity for all of us uh, from the green economy. So look up their report. That will build buy-in, I think. It is actually a chance to re-industrialize the north of England, the northwest of England. Well, it is industrial to a degree, but actually to, to get back to a point where we're a, we're a true industrial leader, but this time doing it in the right way, and that's why it's, it's so exciting, uh, Helen. But I'm just going to finish on a point by saying there's a wrong way of doing this, and there's a right way of doing this, and it goes back to this buying question. The wrong way is not to fund what's going on across the Northwest, leave the costs to fall on individuals, and then risk a growing public sort of backlash, and actually, you get to a a decarbonized society, but a much less equal society at the end of it, because it's further accentuated uh, the divides that we've got. That is definitely the wrong way, but we could end, you could say we're almost on that path to a degree. There's a, but then there's a right way of doing this, which is to, to reduce the cost of public transport, of rail, of, of buses, of, um, of trams, to retrofit people's homes in the way that you, <laughs> you want to do, so that those homes then become cheaper for people to run, to create all of the good jobs that, that come from a, a scale retrofitting uh, program. You know, that is the right way to do it, so that you're, you don't end up, just end up with greener, you end up with fairer at the end of it. And I think that's the argument the Northwest is uniquely placed to make. And if we can do that together across all of us, I think we can, we can get heard that this is actually a, a fantastic, this could be the, 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 the catalyst to leveling up the country in, in the right way if it's, done, if it's done properly. If it's not funded properly at this stage, we could lose that buy-in. And we've got a very real example of this. The country's largest clean air zone is coming in. The first phase of it is coming in next year. We've secured some money to help people make the transition from their older vehicles to newer vehicles. But I don't think we've yet got enough money. And bear in mind, this is being imposed on us by the government. When we get to vans, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I'm a little worried about that. How are we going to help everybody upgrade their van so that they don't uh, face a charge? And if we can't come up with a convincing way of doing that, then we could lose that buy-in that is so, so important. And so, you know, it might be that we have to come to all of you, big businesses helping small businesses. You know, the Northwest, I think, is not just going to have to think of traditional, let's have some more money from the government. It's partly that, Helen. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to have to create networks where big, big helps small, where, where everybody pitches in and we all help each other uh, to, to get there. And that's maybe the next phase of this that needs to start kicking in a bit more, where we just do more of this ourselves 
rather than obviously waiting for solutions to fall out of Whitehall that may never come. And, and Richard, you, you were a, a minister in, in John Major's government. How do you see the government's role and do you see them as a big barrier towards a kind of clean, green, northwest paradise? Well, like always, think it's, it's a bit of each, isn't it? Um, clearly, things like money, the more money you've got, the more you can do. And uh, the, there is a problem there. But I also think policy is important. And the thing that struck me, and I don't really have a background at all in skills, is that there is a kind of tension across the skills landscape between the educators and the users. And certainly the impression I have got is that we need to refocus the emphasis on a system which is unbelievably complicated to an outsider, uh, onto trying to train people and teach people the skills that are going to be needed for the future. And I think that perhaps there's been too much of an emphasis uh, of an input from the educationalists and not enough on the people who actually want to deploy the skills in the real world. And of course, the, ca the character of the change we're seeing is that the skills that are going to be required in the future are going to look, in many ways, rather different from what we have now. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a bit of carrot and a bit of stick. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Definitely. And Steve, like, what would you say, what's the biggest barrier for you in making your dreams a reality? Well, just on the skills point, if, if we did want to, to do what we um, have planned to do, um, it's not just about the quantum of funding, I understand that. That's really important. But it's about the structure and the strategy of spending that funding. And this government have got it wrong, I have to say. And that, that's not part of political, because I think most governments believe that command and control from the centre is a better way of doing things. It's not. Because in our area, if we were to do a Mersey Tidal barrage, barrier, or a lagoon, and waited for somehow the government to respond to the skills needs for our area, it would never be done and we would have to try to import skills from somewhere else, and then we know the difficulties with Brexit of doing that. So the very fact that we have individual strategies, so working with the government, we have an industrial strategy, and now we have a growth and prosperity strategy working with the government. Part of that is the skills strategy, and we know what our needs are gonna be, so the only way you can align supply and demand is by giving more devolution more responsibility and more accountability, because that's what Boris Johnson said to me and Andy, that comes with it, more accountability to local areas. Well, I'll take the accountability any time of the day, but we need those other things so that we can get those people who are interested in those jobs of the future in the right streams now. We can't just turn the tap on in four years time and say, we're gonna have all these people in the green industrial revolution. We need young girls, for instance, to be turned on to STEM, and we're doing that in our area. We're just opened Eureka, um, at, for, uh, it's in Halifax at the moment. We're doing one over in the water in, in, in the Wirral, and that'll get school kids through the system to turn them on to the jobs of the future. Government can't do that for us, and we need the help and assistance and support of the national government. Can I just make a quick point on that, Helen, just to build on it? We've got to get our heads in the right place here. You cannot legislate your way to net zero. You can't do this from national regulations, laws. It's, that's part of it, because that will help the bottom move to where it needs to you know, bring up the slowest. But if you're going to get the pace into this, it is going to be cities, city regions, all parts of the country that will actually drive it from the bottom up and join the dots and make it all, make it all work. And I'm not sure that penny's dropped yet in Whitehall. They're still sort of going slow on skills devolution. We're still waiting for a leveling up white paper. I don't think we're going to get there without freeing up city regions like ours to really now move this and drive this at pace. And we can't really wait. And I, I just think that message is such an, Steve was making it, such an important one uh, in, this, in this discussion. We have set up a retrofit task force to try and bring housing providers with skills providers, but we're almost working around the system rather than, if you like, the system sort of going with the grain of what we're trying to achieve. Net zero will be achieved bottom up, not top down. Mm -hmm. And I think Whitehall needs to wake up to that pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And I mean, some of the proposals that we've heard about on the panel this morning require individual behavior change. I think, Richard, you said it, it requires each of us to step up and do our bit. But sometimes those behavior changes are either expensive or 
don't look as fun as, I don't know, sitting in your nice warm car, if that's your bag. Um, uh, what, Joe, what, what do you, th how, how are you going to inform and support people to make better choices if, if we are all in it together, to coin a phrase? Yeah, I mean, I think there definitely is a, a big challenge of, of communication in this still. Um, and we've already, I think we've come a long way. Uh, Net, Net Zero Northwest, for example, you've already referred to, have done a fantastic job of explaining uh, the scale of the opportunity here, but I think we need to keep going. Um, I still sometimes struggle to get my head completely around high net, not being a chemical engineer, so just understanding this and then explaining the changes to people. Um, there's something already we've touched on about incentives and costs. If there are significant upfront costs and you're a small business, you may have want to go down that net zero route, but it's incredibly difficult for you whilst running your business to both have made the cost and understand what, what you can do. Um, and then I do think, just touching on the point we've made about education and skills, there's something about inspiring people about the opportunity as well. That's the thing that will help make the change. So we had a, a session a few weeks back where we were talking about the fashion industry, for example. Now, the fashion industry is a huge carbon emitter and has contributed a lot through fast fashion. But it's also an industry that can make people desire and want things differently. So actually, we can change behavior by taking different skill sets, a creative approach, and understanding the industries that can influence behavior, but setting different, different aspirations through that. Um, so a lot to do, but I think that it's, it's, it's all about communication for me. Mm -hmm. And Sarah, is there anything you want to pick up on from, from the discussion about you know, how we incentivize people or all the barriers that are in your way in Lancashire? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think ditto everything everybody said, um, but I think there's another important element to this as well when we talk about what the public sector needs to finance. The private sector uh, will support some of this as well, uh, but for them, they need to see certain things in play and they need confidence and certainty. So they'll be looking for you know, a policy approach that's got longevity, that's got cross-party support, so you know, it's not going to fall over uh, in a couple of years' time. I think they're looking for an ecosystem that's working so you know, we've talked about skills, but business support, uh, innovation, all of those kind of things will be really, really important. And, and I think just in terms of sort of changing behaviors, it is gonna be a challenge. So, you know, some of this is gonna change because you know, maybe the tap gets switched off so you can't buy a new diesel petrol car after 2030. So it kind of nudges you down that road. But I think there's something really important about you know, COP at the moment. People are talking about it, they're having conversations about it, we're seeing great decisions being made. We need the kind of the, the follow through in that space. But, but you know, we've, we've got a number of ways of kind of making this habitual uh, and embedded within our mindset so we can all do our parts. Businesses can engage their workforces in, in how they decarbonize their own businesses. You know, and how they're innovating for, for the future. Schools and school children. You know, um, we've talked about skills, but you know, co-developing. You know, thinking about new ways of living. You know, and and you know, creating a generation that's got a conscience about this. That's that's thinking about um, how how they want to work. And then, of course, we've all got kind of mass engagement vehicles, haven't we? Through local authorities, through politicians. Um, you know, through a whole different set of anchor institutions where. You know, we've got that communication vehicle, so we should be pushing out, using that uh, to get, get some of the key messages out, some of the behavioral change that we need. Thank you. And um, we've basically run out of time, so one very, very quick question for all of you, and it can be a one-word answer. Are you optimistic or pessimistic about the outcomes of COP? Andy, and we'll come through to Steve. Can I go last? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm kind of mixed, if I'm honest. I was there last week. Sorry, this, this is not, not a one-word one word answer. answer. I know you wanted the one. One sentence. I, I was there last week and I got worried because I didn't, as I said at the start, I didn't see the messages landing yeah. from that very high level, billionaires, private jets. It didn't feel right. It felt like a trade fair. Yeah. I'm, on, I'm just being honest, actually. Mm -hmm. So going back today, and that's what I tried to say at the start, let's get the real world into yeah. this thing now. The, the key for me is, not can the drive word. to net zero lower the cost of living for people? If you can answer that question positively, yeah. I think you can get more optimistic. So at the moment, I'm, I don't know, I'm in, it's in the balance. COP is in the balance for me, and the next four days yeah. will decide whether or not it achieves yeah. anything meaningful. Sorry, right, about Joe, 50 be, word answer. be quicker than him. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I'm optimistic, but less about the two weeks of the debates in COP 
but more about uh, the points already made, you know, the importance of local leadership. I think the increased awareness that we've seen, not just in the last two weeks, but the last few years, but the importance now is delivery. And I yeah. think that's the crucial thing. This has to be the decade of delivery, and that's what we can do locally. Thank you. Richard? Andy will be appalled that a man who's a minister in the John Major's government agrees with what he's just said. <laughs> no, I think there's going to be lots of fine words, but fine words butter no parsnips. Yep. And, and the test is going to be not the fine words, but what then actually True. happens on the ground. And the jury's out. Thank you. True. Sarah? Um, optimistic about things like this, not so much COP, um, because I think it demonstrates that the kind of the collective efforts of getting things done and making yeah. things happen, it, that's going to happen at a local level. Steve, the final word. Andy will always find it difficult to say anything nice with his football allegiance about something <laughs> called COP. Um, <laughs> For, for me, Liverpool I, are working towards a zero trophy system. <laughs> <laughs> for, for me, um, I'm really optimistic about what we will present on behalf of the North West. I'm slightly pessimistic about some of the global leaders and whether they'll step up to the plate. Thank you so much. Um, sorry we've run over a bit of time, but it was great to get a bit of discussion as well as the presentation. So thank you so much to our five panellists. Thank you to you for listening. I think we're going to see seamlessly into the next session. Thanks so much. Thanks, Helen, and, uh, and thanks for keeping us vaguely to time. Our next session this morning is going to be moderated by the excellent Paul Corcoran, uh, and it's going to focus on transport. Uh, and because we are running over, I'm wondering, Paul, whether you can shave a couple of minutes off the journey for us. I'm sure I can. Okay, thanks very much. The next session is going to be looking at transport, and obviously we've had Andy and the leaders there, just there I'll talk. see you up in Glasgow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to be talking about transport. Um, we're, <laughs> we're going to be talking about, obviously Andy and the leaders talked about a big ambition for the Northwest to lead the next industrial revolution in a green, clean and sustainable way but transport is inevitably going to play a major part in this. And how do we make sure that we get the infrastructure and indeed our behaviors ready to on. see that future? Um, I'm delighted listening. to be joined by <laughs> well a stellar done. panel of experts. Um, they are Chris Boardman, Cycling and Walking Commissioner from Greater Manchester Combined Authority. Councillor Liam Robinson, lead member for transport and air quality for Liverpool City Region Combined Authority. Adrian Gray, COO and co-founder of IDUNA and BEV. Um, Gareth Fudge, electric vehicle project development manager for SSE. And Miranda Barker, CEO of East Lancashire Chamber of Commerce and Redcat, Lancashire Centre for Alternative Technologies. We need to be speeding through this, so I'm going to go straight to the panel, and I'm going to come to you first, Chris, if I could. Um, we heard in the previous session the need for us to encourage new behaviours, new ways of travel. How do we get people out of their war certainly days like today, you know, weather not great, weather is changing, how do we make it attractive and how do we encourage people out of their cars and onto sustainable and more active ways of, of, of travelling? Thanks. Well, I think there's two points, really. If you can't look out of your car window and see something at least as attractive and easy as what you're doing now, why would you get out of the car? And that's, that's a fundamental truth that we have to address up front at the start. Don't try and pretend it's not there. If it's not easy, if it's not attractive, if it's not as cost effective, why am I going to change? And that's why the whole integration of transport is so important. Now, I, a third of our journeys uh, are, are less than a kilometre, our car journeys. That's over 200 million car journeys a year in a car in this city region are less than a kilometre. So that's easily walkable, whether it's cloudy or sunny. And my job, first as active travel um, uh, commissioner, 
was to enable people to do that, not encourage them, enable them to do it and start to look at the barriers. So you might have seen yesterday on social media, we want to put a, a, a crossing at every side road on the quieter streets so parents feel able to let their kids just walk to school. That in the real world is what climate action looks like simple things like that and in terms of the, there was a takeaway for the audience what would be the one thing that we can all start doing today in order to start to drive that behavior change number one is try it try doing something differently <coughs> first of all take that first step so i gave my car up two years ago and i'm not um, evangelical about oh you can't have a car i just thought i'll try this and i've done it for two years and I, I, i've got i can ride to the station it's half an hour away you think, oh, half an hour. But ride in both ways. I've just done my exercise without even thinking about it. I don't go to a gym and, and that build it into my life. So trying doing something different. And right now, I would resent. So car, £7,000 a year to run a car. I haven't paid that £7,000 for two years. Uh, and they're the kind of things we need to talk to people about. Because the reality is, outside of this room, and we know the, the science of why we've got to change, uh, it, people are worried about paying the bills, um, and it, but if you can say this is how much money you can save, that is a message that resonates with everybody, uh, and I think that's the language we need to speak. So great body and great bank account is basically what Chris Boardman is saying to you. So <laughs> ditch the ditch the car, Liam. I'm going to come across to you. We um we have a, a geographically diverse um, northwest. Obviously, some areas are better connected th than others. What can we be doing? What can we all be doing to, to connect and find new ways of helping people travel throughout our great region? Okay, well, for me, there's a number of different things that we really need to do. Uh, and we've got to get the kind of hierarchy of transport in the right order at the end of the day. We have to have sustainable modes first because 30% of our emissions actually come from transport. The vast majority of that is coming from private cars. We've really got to turn that on its head. For me, there's a variety of things that we need to do. First and foremost, with public transport, we actually need to move to properly comprehensive bus networks, not just in our city regions, but right across our rural areas. There's been a great piece of work that the Campaign for Rural England have done about how you could connect all of Britain's villages to all of their regional centres with at least a bus service every hour, and you'd pay for that by top slicing the roads budget if you can put things like that in place, then people actually genuinely have a public transport option that they could use. There's lots of things we also need to do around active travel. And a key part of that actually is high quality infrastructure that gives people the confidence to ride their bikes and walk uh, accordingly. But for me, I think we also got to think around, particularly on the cycling uh, agenda, I don't ride my bike quite as often as Chris, but quite frankly, I'm sick and tired of scaring myself to death on B roads. We really need to think about motorists' behavior around cyclists. And if that means we have to sort of shift the balance of liability uh, with regard to kind of uh, safety and those aspects, then I think we really need to kind of grasp hold of that. There's also huge opportunities around technological advances in all of this. Um, everything from demand responsive bus services, we've got a great pilot going on in Speak in Liverpool at the moment, through to how we could move to uh, zero emission carpools. We don't all need to own a car, we can move to something that's much more uh, shared. But also micro mobility uh, solutions. We've got a fantastic e scooter pilot happening in Liverpool at the moment. About a fifth of the city have used an e-scooter. It's one of the most successful in Europe at this moment in time. There's all of those different models and, and modes that we can, we can try out. The final point for me though, and it builds off what Chris has said, what Andy said, what Steve has said. If we genuinely want to get people traveling differently, we have got to make it cheap. And that's gonna involve a number of different things. It'll be new business models for public transport, moving to something where quite frankly, we're reinvesting most of the profits in the service, not seeing them leave as has been the case in the past. But also you can't get away from the fact that we will need to put a lot more public money into these things to subsidize them. Because if we can address that co cost of living question that Andy was talking about, the people will follow in terms of how they will make their transport choices. But if we make it expensive, then quite frankly, people will stick with what they're doing today. 
That's great. Thank you so much, Liam. Adrian, I'm going to come to you now. Obviously, we're all aware of electric and hyd hydrogen vehicles, but actually, the, the uptake is still relatively low across our region. How do we make sure that we've got the, the right infrastructure in place so that actually when people start to move into that mode of transport, we can actually help fuel and charge their vehicles to get them to where, where they want to be? Yeah. So, also, it's a very quick background. BEV, we're a network of electric vehicle charging infrastructure here in Greater Manchester, um, the largest network in Greater Manchester, and focused just on the Northwest. But what I also often talk about is the chicken and egg dilemma. So, people don't want to buy an EV until there's the infrastructure there. People don't want to deploy the infrastructure until there's enough electric vehicles in the region. And so, we need to break that cycle. And that's very much our approach is not thinking about, we've got to build it now and kind of drive the change, break the cycle, build it, and then people will be more comfortable switching to electric vehicles. And key of that is not just doing it in the affluent areas, not just building the ones and twos, but actually building the infrastructure for the future. So thinking five years ahead, thinking 10 years ahead, let's not just kind of think about the here and now, but really kind of go for the future. And it needs to be easy, it needs to be accessible, and give people that comfort to go to EV. Then you come to another barrier, which is finding the right sites. Uh, and so we're always looking for more sites which can actually help facilitate and drive that future growth. And then the final thing I'd also just say is we always think of this as a challenge or as an issue. We use these negative words. But actually, how can we use this new kind of wave of adoption of EVs really as an opportunity as well? Because we could use EV to really transform neighborhoods. We could use it to kind of really bring about the development and the investment in that region to greening those areas. And actually, therefore, the benefits aren't just for the EV drivers, but also for everyone in that region as well. That's great. Adrian, I mean, you, you talked there about the, the opportunity, and I'm going to come to you now, um, Gareth. You know, the opportunity for us to travel more sustainably, for us to have cleaner air. But let's talk about the opportunity for investment. What, do, what does that present in terms of our region, our businesses, and, and those who want to come in and put their money where their mouth is. Talk us through that. Yeah, so obviously from SNC, um, so for us, we, just to give a bit of scene set, we've committed within SNC 150 million pounds to build 300 hubs um, across the UK. Um, we'll do that in three to five years. We are looking to transform 100 bus depots um, and help fund that transformation. Um, so yeah, that money is there, that's secured. We have the people, we have nearly 300 people employed in this sector, looking at the whole system thinking from batteries to solar, where I sit in EV. And yeah, it's not, it's not an easy fix. So part of it is about that visibility. We need to get the relationships, the partnerships, particularly with the LOAs, get visibility, make it seem, yeah, we could do this. Um, I speak about my, my own uh, partner very nervous about transforming to an EV. How do you charge it? You know, will, will I just come to a stop in a road somewhere? None of that's going to happen. So it's about getting visibility now. Um, what, what, what are the issues then? So here we are. I sit here, walk into a meeting with the LOA. We've got the money to build this. But again, the LOAs have got other priorities. Obviously, COVID, we're out the back of that. There's lots of things going on. So are we the priority? Maybe not. There's procurement, there's supply chains. What mean? What happens if the investors like myself and Adrian come in and we put the money up? What does that mean for our procurement, our supply chain? And we're saying, well, we can work with your supply chain. We can do all these things. So there's a wee bit of a barrier there. We need to get some pilot schemes going, working with the local authorities. On the private sector, we look at commercial spots to build our hubs. Now we're going to put, we could put a half a million pound into a hub. So we want some surety around that. We want good value. So we've got to get the commercial deals right. Um, we are competing against, shall we say, you know, the coffee outlets, the fast food outlets for the best spots. Do we offer the best rentals? Do we offer the best rates? Well, possibly not. Um, because what we're doing is, it's more visionary what we're doing. It's, it's five years time that you could see a massive energy use and shift in the public towards this. So, so we're quite conservative in terms of where we set that expectation. And can a private landlord get better value elsewhere? Maybe, but we, our argument is 
Only in the short term. <laughs> Only short term, not in the longer term. So I would say these are the things that I would appeal today to, to the local authorities and the private landlords. Come and speak to SSE and, and Adrian's company. We, we are set up, it's surprising. People think, oh, we're not ready. We are ready. <laughs> we need the help to find and locate the sites, build, get the visibility, and then take the public on the journey to, to the Thanks so much for that, Gareth. Um, Miranda, I'm going to come to you now. You, obviously, you're doing incredible work in terms of support and innovation and coming up with new ways of dealing with some of the, the challenges that we're facing in the, in the kind of transport arena. But obviously, technology and innovation is going to play a major role in, in helping us develop those solutions. What can we do to stimulate new entrepreneurs, new ideas in this space, and then most importantly, and, and a toughie this one, how do we then make sure that that new technology is, is adopted by, by all of us? You're absolutely right. Those are, those are two of the key questions. And we've, we've had a load of our companies from East Lancashire who were, were supporting along that innovation route up in, in Glasgow this week. And the tricky bits we've identified, Sarah's already touched on when she talked about our Red Cap project. It's really hard to demonstrate your technology and to be supported in doing that, so to find the funding to do that. And then it's also really hard to find the early stage funding before you've got that customer to develop it. And those are the things that we're dealing with the Red Cap project. And we will hear from one of our companies later today, Advanced Bacterial Sciences, who will be speaking this afternoon, and another one, ENR Group, they're actually producing the manufacturing lines for the EV batteries of the future for our electric vehicle changes. So that's the kind of ecosystem of support we need to, to put in place to help people develop new technologies. But how to actually get them taken up is, there's a real bell curve in terms of early adopters and then the general business community and then those who will always be pushed along by taxation. So the early adopters are already there. Uh, companies like Crystal Doors, who we took to Scotland with us, they're already making really, really strong profile changes, and they've got economic benefit from doing that, and they're attracting customers and employees and partners by doing that. There's a real financial benefit for adopting it early, and those at the back end will always only be pushed along by the carbon taxation, and we need to have government telegraphing in an early sort of warning way that this will come. But how do we move the general business population? How do we make it easy to, to adopt those technologies? And really, there are three things. There's, there's policy changes. If we do see policy changes, not just in, in the national sense, but in local sense, we need Andy and Steve and Sarah and all of the others to step up and make those policy changes so that our customers are drawing us in that direction. If all of the planning requirements are changed and we have stronger baselines for what needs to be put in place, if all the public sector procurement is saying we need proactive, carbon active companies to supply into us, that's your customer base saying go in this direction, and, and you will. But a really big thing that came out from Glasgow was the need for sound green financing to help people adopt those technologies. And I don't necessarily mean subsidies, I don't mean grants, I just mean sensible green financing so that if you know something's got a payback period of five years, that green financing helps you pay for it now and then pay back with the savings that you've made. Make it easy. But our, our tricky problem is how to go beyond the practicality of what we see in our countries. We, we come up with these sensible solutions. But how do you then get that technology taken up globally? And we're going to need to have a real mental shift. Imagine vaccine equity, where we've been seeing the vaccines being given overseas for free to countries. We're going to need green technology equity. We're going to need to do the innovation here where we can and we invent it, but we're going to then need to give that technology internationally so that we're not waiting 50 years for India to catch up. We need to give them that technology so they can keep pace with our changes. Thank you, Miranda. We've got a couple of minutes, because um, I know we've got a hard stop at 25 past. I'm just going to move uh, go along the panel, really, and say if there was one thing that could come out in terms of the legacy for COP26, from a Northwest perspective, what would it be for, for, for you, Chris? I think commitment is, uh, is, is, I mean, that's the big word that everybody's looking for, is commitment. Um, define where we want to be, not in 50 years or 20 years, 10 years works, and five years, and then commit to doing those things. 
Thanks, Chris. Um, Liam. Very simple uh, for me, Paul. Fully funded, comprehensive, cheap public transport. If we do all of that, then we've got a fighting chance of getting people out of cars. If we don't, I think we're in a difficult situation. Thank you, Liam. Um, Adrian. Uh, for me, it's a kind of continued focus. I think the fact is, I don't want it to be a, a two-week kind of high and then suddenly it disappears again. We've built so much momentum over the last months building up to this, and it's starting to kind of cut through from the politicians to business decisions to decisions we all make every single day, and we really need to make sure that we keep this momentum going, and then in the week after, the months after, the years after, we keep that at the forefront of everything we do and all of our decisions. Excellent, thank you. Adrian. Sorry, Gareth. Gareth. <laughs> yeah, for me, it's, it's commitment. I've talked about the barriers. We need you to help SSE, you know, I talk for SSE, we need you to help us take the barriers down, get the pilots, get the focus there, the infrastructure gets built, the visibility is there, people will transform. We will all get on board. So it's, it's about getting that commitment from the people in this room, Greater Manchester area. So that, that would be my challenge to you. Thank you. And finally, Miranda. I want us to take that commitment and take it forward into action. I want to see our Northwest leaders doing what they were promising here and saying we can lead and making those policy changes, giving us the green financing and really driving the inevitability for all of us to, to do exactly what we've said here and really catalyze, be the, be the, the, the vanguard for the UK. We've got the technological uh, ability and we've got the will, so let's actually see the action happen. Thank you. I'd like to thank our expert panel for their thoughts, commitment and ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lots of food for thought there and hopefully it starts with us. Enjoy the next session. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Paul, um, and that was brilliantly chaired. Um, you got us back on time. I was going to give you an extra five minutes. We now have a break, everybody. Thanks for bearing with us with the audio. Um, I think somebody wanted to start a rave there for a minute with some music breaking through. We now have a break until 11.55 when we got our smart building session. Please take some time to look at the displays, and there's tea, coffee, and pintos from Barachuri. So please come back at 11.55. Thank you. in the UK to adopt an accelerated carbon reduction plan over the next five years. We're setting the standard for others to follow. Working with the government, we want to bring a London-style integrated public transport system to Greater Manchester, which will help us remove a million tonnes of carbon from the Greater Manchester economy over the next three years, achieving our ambitious science-based goal of a net zero Greater Manchester by 2038. 12 years ahead of the rest of the UK will require everyone here to play their part. We're spending £80 million this year on reducing the carbon impact from the public buildings, but also looking at our 1.2 million homes and how we can retrofit those. You know, the opportunities that the facilities like Energy House 1 and Energy House 2 provide gives that real opportunity to innovate much more quickly, bring things to the market. So the Energy Innovation Agency is really exciting development because it's bringing together partners from across the city. 
We're also trying to deliver more low carbon renewable energy here within the city. Now, the Fuel Cell Centre is a £4.1 million research and innovation centre. We're very focused on green hydrogen, so we're working in various different projects on electrolyzers, which ultimately will help us generate lots and lots of green hydrogen, which will be part of our UK-wide net zero plans. We've got our community forest called City of Trees, with their aim of planting a tree literally for every man, woman and child in the city region. Mayfield was conceived in 2016 to redevelop 25 acres of land right in the heart of the city centre. It sits at the heart of a seven acre park. So the B network is, it will eventually comprise 1,800 miles of fully connected cycling and walking routes across the city region. It's going to cost £1.5 billion. It's a perfect option to tackle health, uh, inequality and of course pollution. The Green Revolution will help us reduce inequalities and we want the government to back our ambitions to tackle climate change through a new Greater Manchester levelling up deal.
public transport system to Greater Manchester, which will help us remove a million tonnes of carbon from the Greater Manchester economy over the next three years, achieving our ambitious science-based goal of a net zero Greater Manchester by 2038, 12 years ahead of the rest of the UK, will require everyone here to play their part. We're spending £80 million this year on reducing the carbon impact from the public buildings, but also looking at our 1.2 million homes and how we can retrofit those. You know, the opportunities that the facilities like Energy House 1 and Energy House 2 provide give us that real opportunity to innovate much more quickly and bring things to the market. So the Energy Innovation Agency is a really exciting development because it's bringing together partners from across the city. We're also trying to deliver more low-carbon renewable energy here within the city. Now, the Fuel Cell Centre is a £4.1 million research and innovation centre. We're very focused on green hydrogen, so we're working in various different projects on electrolyzers, which ultimately will help us generate lots and lots of green hydrogen, which will be part of our UK-wide net zero plans. We've got our community forest called City of Trees, with their aim of planting a tree literally for every man, woman and child in the city region. Mayfield was conceived in 2016 to redevelop 25 acres of land right in the heart of the city centre. It sits at the heart of a seven acre park. So the B network is, it will eventually comprise 1,800 miles of fully connected cycling and walking routes across the city region. It's going to cost £1.5 billion. It's a perfect option to tackle health, uh, inequality and of course pollution. The Green Revolution will help us reduce inequalities and we want the government to back our ambitions to tackle climate change through a new Greater Manchester levelling up deal.
Greater Manchester is the first city region in the UK to adopt an accelerated carbon reduction plan over the next five years. We're setting the standard for others to follow. Working with the government, we want to bring a London-style integrated public transport system to Greater Manchester, which will help us remove a million tonnes of carbon from the Greater Manchester economy over the next three years. Achieving our ambitious science-based goal of a net zero Greater Manchester by 2038, 12 years ahead of the rest of the UK, will require everyone here to play their part. We're spending £80 million this year on reducing the carbon impact from the public buildings, but also looking at our 1.2 million homes and how we can retrofit those. You know, the opportunities that the facilities like Energy House 1 and Energy House 2 provide give us that real opportunity to innovate much more quickly and bring things to the market. So the Energy Innovation Agency is really exciting development because it's bringing together partners from across the city. Thank you. 
We're also trying to deliver more low carbon renewable energy here within the city. Now the Fuel Cell Centre is a 4.1 million pound research and innovation centre. We're very focused on green hydrogen, so we're working in various different projects on electrolyzers, which ultimately will help us generate lots and lots of green hydrogen, which will be part of our UK wide net zero plans. We've got our community forest called City of Trees with their aim of planting a tree literally for every man, woman and child in the city region. Mayfield was conceived in 2016 to redevelop 25 acres of land right in the heart of the city centre. It sits at the heart of a seven acre park. So the B network is, it will eventually comprise 1,800 miles of fully connected cycling and walking routes across the city region. It's going to cost £1.5 billion. It's a perfect option to tackle health, uh, inequality and of course pollution. The Green Revolution will help us reduce inequalities and we want the government to back our ambitions to tackle climate change through a new Greater Manchester levelling up deal.
Okay, everybody, we're about to start again, so if I could get everybody to take their seats, please. Drag yourself away from the gorgeous food back to a seat. That'd be lovely. Thank you. You're bringing me back to life. You're bringing me back to Yeah, yeah.
Okay, if I could get everybody just to take their seats, and we're ready to start the next session. Okay, so if I could get everybody just to take your seats. Great. I, tearing yourselves away from all that loveliness. Um, we'll have more uh, enjoyable break time later, opportunity to see the displays. But we're going to start our next panel session now. Uh, this is, uh, features a series of lightning talks um, and, and a bit of a debate. So it should be really, uh, really, really interesting. The topic of our next session is going to be on smart buildings for a resilient future. So I'd like to welcome our next panel onto the stage. Off you go. Good afternoon, everyone. I was going to say good morning, but we just hit midday. So my name's David Wright, and I'm a land director at Gleason Homes. And uh, we're going to be talking about smart and resilient buildings. So it's a bit different from the last session. It's going to be a, a lightning talk. So we're going to introduce uh, members of the panel come in a second, and each will have five minutes to talk about their expertise. So uh, without further ado, let's just introduce uh, to you all uh, Mike Harrison. Um, Director of Del Delivery at UNI, uh, Alex McDermott, co-founder of uh, Concretine, Tim Whiteley, who's Building Services Engineering Director for Arup, uh, Craig Morley, Energy Manager at Bruntwood, and last but not least, James Richardson, Contract Manager at Robertson Group. So shortly, each of the panel members are going to go through from their expertise and their experience looking at different elements of buildings throughout the Northwest. Um, so just to set the scene on why this is an important matter, so <laughs> to get to net zero, you have to get your buildings in line in terms of how they're used, in terms of how they're heated. There's only transport that has a larger net emissions of uh, carbon uh, that's greater than uh, the way we use our homes, our workplaces, our public buildings. I mean, from my perspective, I work for a house builder, Gleason Homes, and 14% of UK's carbon emissions come from how we heat our homes alone. So it's, it is a massive issue, and it's something that we're all sort of working within the industry to see what we can do to change things. Um, at Gleason Homes, we're looking at predominantly first-time buyers as well, so some of you may be aware that the building regulations are going to be changing next year. It's a huge issue for us in terms of how we manage to overcome some significant hurdles. But with that, there is some significant opportunities as well. So one of the things we're looking to do is introduce air source heat pumps throughout all of our new, new builds over the next uh, two or three years. Um, we'll be removing gas from the equation, but I was just speaking to some of the panel members before. The, again, there's going to be some great hurdles for us to overcome in terms of skill shortages throughout the industry, in terms of the cost to our customers. Um, having said all that, it is something that's doable. Uh, we've got a trial at Whitworth just in, outside of Greater Manchester near Rochdale where we've got one of the first homes hooked up with the air source heat pumps. But what, what some of the colleagues will talk about shortly is uh, not just new builds but existing housing stock. And it's worth knowing today 80% of the buildings that are going to be there in 2050 are already standing right now. So a Greater looks going to be looking at retrofitting and how that will work in the future. Um, there is massive challenges, and some, some of the panel members earlier this morning talked about those massive challenges, but again, there is massive opportunities as well. I mean, I'm more of a, a glass half full guy rather than a glass half empty, and these big opportunities in the Northwest for businesses, there's big opportunities for uh, local authorities, and everyone's striving for the same goal as well, so these, there's definitely a desire to see things done. The Northwest is known for the heart and the creation of manufacturing in the first place. You had the first intercity rail links in the northwest. Uh, Lord Inglewood mentioned before about Sellafield. We, the first commercial nuclear uh, power station in the world was in the northwest. So we've overcome these barriers before, and we can do it again. Um, and it's just something we need to be striving for together. So uh, if Mike, if you just uh, want to run through your, your five-minute piece. OK. Um, welcome here to Mayfield. Um, for those of you who don't know, this is um, a, a 20, uh, sorry, it's a 25-acre site. Um, we've, as part of our sustainable journey, 
We've, de we've dedicated six and a half acres to a public park. Um, and as we, we have this unique opportunity, the building that you're in um, is part of our opportunity and our challenge. And then we have a series of other buildings around the, uh, the curtilage of the park that will, will create the Mayfield development. Um, when we talk about what does sustainability mean for us, um, what, we, what we've been trying to do throughout this process is walk the walk, not just talk. Um, so you, you, you know, quite rightly, there's a, there's a piece of well, what can we do now and what can we do in the future? So current, current activity and next steps, if you like. So as a developer, we looked at um, our park and we set ourselves a target of trying to reduce the embedded carbon by 50%. And, and trying to limit the impact on our neighbors, uh, kind of the social impact, which is also part of sustainability, um, by 60%. And we're doing that right now. We, we revisited the design, and we have pretty much halved the embedded carbon within the park, um, something I'm hoping you're going to read about in, in the press shortly. Um, the, but the most important thing is that the technologies to allow us to get to net zero don't currently exist. And, and we don't sufficiently engage with the investment to do that. Um, so here I am, I've got, I've got new buildings. So as a developer, we've, we've optimized what we can do in the current available technology. So in our first building, we've gone for EPCA. We're 25% better than building regs requirements. We have put as much photovoltaics as we can fit, but we're still nowhere near where we need to be to get net zero. The flip side of that is people aren't asking for it. I've done a bit of a straw poll of, the, of people who've taken, taken lets uh, in the Manchester area recently. The uh, EPC rating and the environmental rating was not high on their selection. It was still price. So, you know, we're, we're, we're at the exception about this. It's, 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 it will be a demand-driven solution. Um, so, but what we can do is engage with everyone that um, presents a, a viable opportunity. So, in terms of uh, all of the vehicles that you see outside driving around in the, um, constructing the park are all running on vegetable oil diesel. So, you know, as it, we are doing everything we can to, to kind of create as low a footprint as we can in delivering the park. However, that investment in carbon does give huge social value to the city, it's the first green lung, the new green lung for the uh, city, six and a half acres. Um, the impact that that will have on people we, will be dramatic. So there's a huge gain in terms of the, uh, from a sustainability in terms of people's health, well-being, um, exercise and all the rest of it. There's still a carbon footprint of the provision of that. It's not as high as it was going to be, but it's, left, uh, it's still significant. In terms of the new buildings, um, what we're trying to do and it will go on to the next speaker, is we're trying to say, well, how can we be smart? Um, is there anything we can do to support people um, it, uh, and try and create those next technologies? So what, when we're looking at embedded carbon, we've been looking at, could, could we find a way of reducing the embedded carbon in, say, a major material we use like concrete? Um, the next speaker will, will, will talk about that, Alex, in a minute. But we, you know, we, we supported that as a development, and. To, to the left, Alex will talk about it, is the first, if you like, green concrete slab, um, where as a developer we took um, a technical risk. Technical risk management is what we do in everything we do, and we took a, we, we reviewed it and then took the opportunity to engage with, with, um, with the geek and with uh, Nationwide to kind of do a proof of concept in the first piece here. So that's, if you like, from a direct delivery engineering point of view, we, can, we are um, engaging with a smart technology. I'm sure from a building services point of view, there's loads we can do. You know, I'm deploying currently the available technologies in terms of managing, managing air flows, managing consumption, but it's, it's quite small. We, we need to take the next step and have readily available to us the technologies that allow us to actively manage space uh, using, using data to people, you know, at the point where you only need to turn the heating on if you're going to get the density of, of population in a building to actually take benefit from it, it if, to a wider degree. The next steps for us are to try and harness some of the things we've learned over the last two years into the new building. So the, one of the 
buildings on site is a car park. Um, we have 580 spaces, and we are currently trying to turn that into an energy center by, you know, if we can persuade 580 people to park their cars there, charge them up overnight, and then maybe create a peak lopping station for, for Manchester in this locality. We know you can do it, but it's not right there for us right now. Okay. Have, that's about my five minutes. I think it was, yeah. Thanks a lot, Mike. And uh, Alex, if you want to uh, give us a talk on embedded energy in new buildings construction. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm Alex McDermott. I'm the co-founder of Nationwide Engineering and Concrete Team. So we're just going to talk a little bit about embodied energy in, in buildings. 250 years ago, the Industrial Revolution was started in Manchester and the northwest of England, and that changed how we constructed buildings forever. Today is the start of the next industrial revolution, and that's on a sustainability uh, construction. And one of the key focuses on that is embodied carbon and smart buildings, the creation of that and the development of the technology associated with it. And it's a very difficult problem to solve because for any given material, it could be manufactured in Manchester, in Europe, in China, wherever it may be. And obviously the embodied carbon associated with that is vastly different. So it is a challenge for the construction industry. We've tackled construction industry's biggest problem, which is concrete. Concrete is the second most widely used substance on the planet, believe it or not, behind water. And it is also responsible for 8% of world CO2 output, a huge figure. If it was a country, it would be the third biggest emitter behind the United States and China. So some food for thought there but it remains an essential material and it will do so in the future. So what we've got to do as an industry is work with existing materials and be smarter about how we use them in the future. So what have we done about it? Nationwide Engineering Group then formed a groundbreaking partnership with the University of Manchester and specifically the Graphene Engineering Innovation Centre affectionately known as the Geek, um, and that was about two and a half, just over two and a half years ago. And we've been developing Concrete Team, which is a graphene enhanced concrete. What graphene does in concrete is it enhances the structure and makes the uh, material more efficient, and that enables three things. Firstly, the reduction in the amount of concrete required to start with. Secondly, the elimination of reinforcements and construction joints and thirdly, reducing the cement content of the concrete, and the cement is where the vast majority of the vast bulk of the, the carbon is. So the result of that has enabled us to reduce the associated embodied uh, carbon by 30%. Now we know we can go much further than that, but the technology is new, and we're on a journey now to push the limits and see how far we can take the technology, but we are confident we can go much, much further. We took the technology out of the lab only in May this year, and we constructed the world's first ever graphene-enhanced concrete slab. And since then, we've uh, uh, laid around about 700 tons of the material. And would you believe it, there's one right there. So just behind the <coughs> curtains here, you can probably just see the edge of a slab there for the roller disco. Um, that slab there we constructed three weeks ago today. And it is 54 meters long, 14 and a half meters wide, a suspended slab, so obviously appropriate for high-rise developments. Uh, no reinforcements in it whatsoever or construction joints, and basically what that means is a, a CO2 saving on that very slab alone of uh, almost four and a half tons. On other slabs have gone much, much further. So it shows you the potential of what we can do being smart with the existing concrete materials uh, that we use in construction every single day. And therefore, it will come as no surprise that we can actually use this technology, apply it to all concretes around the world with the potential to save more CO2 than a small country emits. But that is challenging. Unfortunately, particularly in construction, everything's against new technology and innovation. Um, standards aren't set to allow you to use innovation. The insurers run for the hills as soon as you say innovative. And so it's really challenging for us to sort of break through uh, get the funding which is near and impossible and, and really work through to get these new technologies in, into industry. 
Um, but it's not for the lack of trying, and we'll continue to try. Um, I think the last message really is to, to drive this change is we've all got to work together and by that I don't mean just the construction industry. I mean the people that will use buildings, maintain buildings, occupy the buildings. You've got to demand lower embodied carbon and together we'll, we'll crack it as a team but there's no one component within the industry that can do it on its own. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Alex. And uh, Tim, uh, Building Services Engineering Director uh, from Arup, if you want to run through uh, your work with domestic buildings. Okay, yeah, thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to talk sort of around sort of three headings, really. Firstly, just reminding you of some of the numbers that you've already heard already, um, particularly related to domestic. Um, and then talk a bit about new build, but really focus on existing domestic properties, because that's really where the challenge is. Um, so, yes, yeah, so buildings are responsible, as you've already heard, for 30% of carbon emissions in the UK. Of that, most of that is related to heat, and most of that heat carbon emissions are related to domestic. So 17% of UK emissions are related to heating uh, our domestic properties. Um, and of those, the majority of the properties are going to be around, as you say, 80% of 2050. Um, you know, here in Manchester, we've got a carbon neutral challenge um, sooner than that, of 2038. So 90% of, of the ones locally um, are still going to be with us. So new build, you've heard, you can get new build to EPCA. Um, there are various technologies, um, and you know, those technologies vary. It's not a one size fits all. Um, it's not heat pumps is the only solution, and it's not heat pumps only. You know, there's photovoltaics, there's smart controls, and we were talking about smart controls and innovation. Control of heat in buildings can have a significant reduction in the amount of, of heat energy that you need, um, associated also, obviously, with better insulation and so forth. So modern buildings and new buildings, from a legislative point of view, um, are highly insulated, um, and efficient systems are being put in. Um, and associate those with PV, battery storage, uh, demand response, and efficient ways of ventilating them. And you might not get to net zero at the moment, as Mike say, Mike's saying, but you're very close. The challenge is our existing uh, housing stock. Um, you know, in Greater Manchester, the estimate is just under a million properties need to be retrofitted um, from an insulation point of view to even get close to, to putting new technologies in for heating. Um, the government has recently uh, issued, in a couple of weeks ago, its uh, heat and building strategy. And there, they're putting in place um, some backstops, really. So we're talking about EPCA for new build, and that can be achieved. They're talking about achieving EPCC for existing buildings in the private rented sector uh, by 2025. So if you're going to be uh, letting out new private rented sector, you need to get to EPCC. So that shows the difference and the challenge between new build and existing. Um, and how do we do that? Well, the way we've got to do that is retrofit at scale. Um, and you know, Greater Manchester Combined Authority um, have uh, committed to a retrofit at scale project where they're looking at uh, you know, 60,000 uh, homes being retrofitted per year. There's a skills and training issue that's being addressed as part of that. Um, you know, it's not about new technology. This isn't about clever ways of doing things. This is stuff that we can do now. Um, and part of this, again, is about getting homes ready. Um, there's, a, there's a decision point um, around whether we go all electric solutions or whether we go hydrogen solutions. Um, national government have um, kept their options open at the moment and actually delayed decisions around hydrogen heating for homes till 25, 26. Um, but what they're, what they're committed to and pushing for is that we still got to upgrade our existing housing stock, whatever solution we have in terms of insulation, in terms of better controls, in terms of understanding ways of perhaps better ventilating them. Um, there are challenges and there are some challenging across the Northwest. Not all people are on uh, the gas grid. If you're off ga gas grid, uh, the proposals and the latest uh, heat and building strategy is that you know you, you will not be able to replace existing heating systems with fossil fueled um, systems you will have to provide zero carbon heating for those properties from 2025 end of 2025 26 so they're really pushing 
um, that in the heart, in, in areas off the gas grid, that you have to do things differently. Um, there is what's called a future home standard. Um, that's, uh, again, the full implementation of that is delayed till 2025, although an interim is coming out next year. Um, that's going to be pushing at least for an 80% um, reduction in carbon emissions from status quo. Um, so there are significant moves uh, in the industry. There are significant legislative things coming through, whether you're a, a, private, uh, pri whether you're a private landlord. Um, so we've got to start doing this now. Um, and we've got to do some of the no regrets things at the moment, which are particularly around insulation, about improving energy efficiency of homes, even if um, the challenges around hydrogen and heat pumps aren't quite resolved at the moment. Excellent. Thanks, Tim. And uh, obviously, moving from domestic buildings onto uh, more of the commercial buildings, uh, Craig, as energy manager at Brentwoods, uh, give some of your experience. Yeah, sure. Um, so, as already mentioned, most of the buildings you see around Manchester will still be here in 2038. Um, there's an urgent need to look at how we use the buildings and what we do with the buildings to be able to make them fit for purpose in a more sustainable world. Um, there's multiple issues that need to be addressed to be able to actually get to where we need to be. One of the biggest ones is that owners of, especially multi-occupancy buildings, will need to work with the occupiers and actually work together to get to where we need to be. It's not just going to be that the owner needs to deploy new technologies or that the occupiers need to do things differently. It's about working together to achieve what we need to do. There has been some progress in commercial retrofit. Um, however, it's not enough. Um, a lot of focus has been on new builds. Um, to be honest, new builds, it's easier. You're starting from the ground up. If you think of commercial retrofit, how do you do it? Do you do it when the building's empty? Do you have to empty the building? Do you move people out, move them round? Um, there's big challenges, and a lot of owners are kicking the can down the road, if you like, uh, waiting to see what the neighbor does before they make a move. Well, we've got to stop doing that, and we've got to start to actually make a difference. Building owners do know that we've got to do something with changes to EPC rules. We won't be able to let space in a few years if it doesn't meet the, the correct standard. Also, we all have net zero carbon commitments that we need to make. Um, so we need to know how we're going to get there and what, what do we need to do. So at Bruntwood, we've started doing condition surveys, looking at our stock in detail and working out actually what do we need to do, not as a bare minimum, but what do we need to do to get the buildings to where they need to be? The challenge is that how do we fund the interventions that are needed? Um, a lot of the occupiers of the buildings are on fixed rents or capped service charge. So we make the investment. How do we recover that investment from the occupiers of the building? Is there a way that we can work together with the occupiers to rentalize, if you like, investments in sustainability so that we can make the investment, we can recover our costs, but the occupiers of the building can actually benefit from that investment, um, a win-win situation. There are different uh, activities taking place across Greater Manchester, so the Greater Manchester local energy markets are looking at the local energy plans. Now, Jenny from Energy Systems Catapult will um, talk to you more about those later. But from these plans, it will give developers and landowners a, a clearer view of what needs to happen with their estate and what is possible on their estate, removing one of the barriers, if you like, to we don't know what to do. And then there's solar. So although we have deployed a lot of solar in Greater Manchester and we are planning to deploy more solar, commercial solar on rooftops, it's not there yet. Main problem is legacy kit. Where do we put the solar? Um, how do we get onto the roofs of the tallest buildings? So there's a lot of challenges that need to be overcome. More research is needed, as I said before, on the shared benefits. How can we make it fair for both sides, for the landlord who has to make money out of the building to be able to operate it, but also the occupier of a building to be able to give them a healthier, more sustainable um, office? Innovation challenges that come out of Innovate UK all seem to be lacking that 
retrofit of the commercial buildings, if you can look back and think back of the different challenges that come out, Innovate UK don't really give any specific challenges to how do you retrofit a commercial building. I think there needs to be more support from that community to actually bring forward innovators and forward thinkers and bring forward people who want to do things a little bit differently um, to show landowners, property owners, developers the right way to do it, a new way to do it, a way that will work for everybody. Building owners also need to think about the rate of return on any investment. Now, obviously, everybody wants a rate of return, and the rate of return on a sustainable investment will be longer than a normal investment. So we've got to think about how the operational costs for that occupier can be reduced. How can we look to get a return on the investment over a long term while benefiting the people in the building? Excellent. Uh, Thanks, Craig. And uh, James, just want to run through your work on public sector buildings? Yep. Uh, it's fair to say there's a lot of property in the public sector. Robertson partner with local authorities mainly to secure grant funding and then work as a turnkey delivery partner. At present, we're working with five local authorities to save around 40,000 tonnes of carbon. Uh, that translates into £12 million worth, worth of local investment. Local authority decarbonisation is dependent upon a holistic approach. Looking at energy conservation, energy generation, such as solar, and also the optimisation of control systems. Stockford House, shown on the right at the bottom, is a building in Stockport that we're working in. Uh, this is a prime example of this. It's a live scheme that we're carrying out both fabric improvements and uh, M&E installations, air source heat pumps, bits of solar and tweaking the existing BMS system. Uh, when we say tweaking the existing BMS, we're looking at how we run and how we operate the building to work best with the technology that we're putting in there. So how do we optimise the heat and the ventilation to work on a lower flow and return temperature that you get from an air source heat pump as opposed to a gas boiler? So the key for me for local authority decarbonisation is the careful consideration of running costs. The resistance that we find in the sector is when you enter conversations with a local authority and you tell them your energy, price, energy bills are going to go up. Because instead of burning gas at three pence a kilowatt unit, we're burning electric. That's where we've got to have the holistic approach to the decarbonisation of the public estate. Excellent. Thanks, James. Um, I think we've just got time for uh, maybe a quick question for each of you. Um, one of the things I was, I was going to ask about what's the biggest constraint, but maybe that's a bit too negative, but I suppose what could be the biggest opportunity uh, for in getting the, the target to get to net zero in the Northwest? What's the Northwest's biggest opportunity to get there? And just while you're all having a, a little think about it, from my perspective, both the biggest opportunity and the biggest hurdle is probably skill shortages. There's massive skill shortages in the construction industry in general. Up where I'm in Cumbria, that is more acute than elsewhere in the Northwest because of the lack of population. But at the same time, we hear about leveling up and the agenda that the government's got. And you think the two could marry up and there could be an opportunity to get people uh, with the adequate skills to be able to basically do a lot of the retrofitting work, but also a lot of the work on new builds as well. Um, so we've had a chance to ask, uh, coming back down the line, James, uh, what's your thoughts? I think the biggest hurdle that we find, because uh, obviously we work uh, in everything from town halls into schools into office blocks that are owned by councils, it's the understanding of the end user and it's, them, it's the devolution of the, the central uh, council carbon plan down to the, the people that are on the ground, the caretakers in buildings and getting their buy-in. Obviously, when we go in and we start to install technology that, I won't use the word cutting edge, but is new, people haven't seen it, they don't have it at home. It's getting that understanding and making sure that they're buying into the process and buying into what we're trying to achieve. Excellent. Thanks for that. And uh, Craig? Yeah, um, I agree. It's getting that buy-in. And in your office, in your workplace, it's that, well, why am I doing this? Why is it cold in the office? Why is the heating not on? It's getting people to move away from thinking, my boss is saving money, we're saving money on the energy bill to more of a, we're actually doing something for the environment. 
So thinking a bit more like you do at home at the workplace is the, the biggest challenge, if you like. Yeah. Tim, where's the opportunities? So I think the biggest opportunity um, is around domestic retrofit. If we can get domestic fit right um, at scale in the Northwest, that's a massive opportunity for us. There is the funding that, that the Northwest has received for that. So the pilot that's being run is fantastic. And that's got added benefits. It's this whole win-win-win piece of it's more jobs, more skills, more training, if we can get that right. But it's also bringing people out of fuel poverty. It's improving well-being in homes. It's improving comfort. And we've got to think about all of those benefits. Thanks for that. Alex? For us, really, it's, it's the fear of the new that we've got to get over. Um, th there are many new technologies out there, concretine being one of probably thousands. And it's that reluctance for the industry to change because they've done something different for the last decades. And, 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 and getting that message across that, you know, we've got to move forwards together and that's you know everybody it's not just the it's not just the construction industry but it's also the, the insurers it's the occupiers um, the people that are going to maintain and run these buildings so we've all got to sort of move together as, as, as one excellent thanks for that and uh, Mike I think we've got to try and uh, we talk about leveling up but we kind of need to democratize being green um, so it really has to be the same for everybody if you look at the car industry, there's been people driving around in Teslas for years, but they cost a huge amount of money. So it, it doesn't allow it doesn't allow the normal normal people like us to actually to be that green. So it, it's about how do we then take the learnings from the car industry and, and not repeat the same mistake, if you like, in the built environment. It has to be simple. It has to be demand driven. So it has to be so it has to be the same price. So it may, maybe that means that we need to level up by making gas an appropriate price relative it's to a carbon footprint of green energy produced in a wind farm or a solar farm. So I think that's, that's the missing piece because people, the whole, everyone is, is price driven, whether they're at the supermarket, whether they're buying a car, whether they're renting an office. That's, it, it has to be, that's where it has to be driven. Excellent. Thanks for that. Just uh, thank all the speakers uh, and thanks for your insight and uh, thoughts in the future. Thank you, David. Um, so we've heard a couple of times that the challenge is to make the energy transition sexy and attractive. I think if we got the first low-carbon roller disco in Manchester, we're in pretty good shape. Um, so um, I should say, in terms of concrete and the work of the geek, they're actually here displaying. So if you want to find out more about that, they're just in the display area when we're having lunch. Our next panel um, now is going to look at how we create, distribute, and store our energy. Uh, and so I'd like to welcome to the stage our next panel, led by Sean, Councillor Sean Turner. Up you come. Yeah, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, as you've just heard, I'm Councillor Sean Turner. I'm actually the Lancashire County Council Cabinet Member for Environment and Climate Change, which is a position we put in place at the last election in May. Obviously, this is a big agenda. We knew we had to get that in, it set up, and a team wrapped around that. And that's exactly what we've been doing. But I'm really pleased to um, welcome this excellent expert panel that I've got here. Um, I've got Helen Boyle. Uh, as the Regional Development Manager from Caden. I've got Wayne Jones at the far end there, uh, OBE, uh, the Director for Man Energy Solutions. Then I've got Matt Turner next to Wayne. Uh, he's a Regional di Director at AECOM. Uh, Johnny Sadler, who I've had the pleasure of meeting before, uh, is the Head of Local Energy, uh, sorry, that's Patrick. He's the Strategic Decarbonisation Manager for Electricity Northwest. And then I've got Patrick Alcorn. Sorry, at the, at the end, I got, I got that wrong, didn't I? Head of Local Energy, BEIS. Um, so, yeah, just to set the scene, it is about how uh, we create, distribute, and, uh, and store our energy going forward. As we look to transition to um, 
different forms of, of heating and, and power. Um, it's going to be big necessary infrastructure changes right across the northwest and the country. Um, currently, we, we, uh, it, it's expected that we will double the amount of electricity, for example, that we need to generate. So really big work. And how do we plan for that? How do we plan for electric vehicles, for example, and, and hydrogen vehicles? Uh, how do we plan where those charges go? How do we get the, I mean, the, I've got an electric vehicle myself, and one of the most common things I get asked about is, is all around charging anxiety. Oh, there's not enough charges. And, and I think um, the County Council Network yesterday put out a, a press release talking about that very issue, actually. Um, and uh, if you take the whole of the, of the country in terms of the county councils, uh, on average, each EV charger is about a mile, uh, 16 miles apart. Uh, but if you look at London, it's a mile apart. And, and in London as a whole, there's more charges than the whole of the county councils across the, the country. So a lot of work to do. How do we also get our rural communities involved in all that? Um, how, how do we swap to hydrogen? Uh, how do we swap to, to using uh, nuclear and in small mod modular reactors? So these are all the questions I, I hope the panel are, are going to be talking about. I, I'm going to give them a couple of minutes each to introduce themselves and what their roles are currently, and then we can stick to that, and then we'll get on to some questions then, which I can, I can throw at you all. So uh, if we start again, I'll go in order of the, uh, the sheet I've got. I've got Helen. I've got you first, if you don't mind. Um, and as I said, Helen is the uh, Regional Development Manager for Cadence. Thanks very much, Sean. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Helen Boyle, Head of Regional Development for the Northwest and the West Midlands for Caden. I'll just give you a couple of minute overview on, on the next few years when it comes to hydrogen because it's going to be in a very exciting time and the, and the Northwest is really right at the heart of it. Just to give you a bit of background on who Caden are, in case you don't know, we're the UK's largest gas distribution network operator. So we own and operate four of the eight gas networks in the UK and we're right at the heart of the transition away from fossil gas or, or natural gas in, in your homes today to hydrogen in the future. And the next few years are, are pivotal in some big decisions on the role that hydrogen will play outside of industry and transport, predominantly talking about heating your homes, which we heard about on the last panel um, and the amount of emissions that that equates for. What we're going to see over the next few years that was outlined on the government's 10-point plan for a green industrial rev revolution uh, that was launched just before Christmas last year is initially blending up to a 20% blend of hydrogen into the gas mains into people's homes without any um, difference notice to your appliances, to your boilers, to the, to the way you heat your homes, your cookers, your gas fires, and that will remove around 7% of carbon emissions without anybody having to make any changes or, or do anything to your homes today. And the decision on, on blending as to whether that goes ahead from a policy perspective is expected around the 2023 mark. And there's a big program of activity called High Deploy, which Cadence are at the heart of delivering, which is looking at blending that up to 20% hydrogen into different settings, into residential properties, commercial properties, and very crucially, industrial processes to make sure there's no impact on, uh, on, on any of those processes there. And one of those trials is going to be starting, a, a significantly large blending trial will be starting in the, in the northwest um, shortly. The next thing on the list is 100% uh, hydrogen heating trial in a village. So that's looking at a village location around 2,000 properties and heating that village um, entirely on 100% hydrogen for at least a year, possibly two or three. Um, and Caden is looking at areas in the northwest at the moment, particularly in Cheshire West and Chester, so not, not too <coughs> far away from Greater Manchester as a potential location for that trial. And what that is aimed at doing is providing Bayes and the HSC with all the evidence that it needs to make around the consumer transition, so really putting people at the heart of all of that in order to make a final heat policy decision, which um, I think Tim talked about actually on the previous panel, in 2026, and that will outline whether or not hydrogen has a significant role to play in decarbonizing the heating in, in people's homes. And that may even lead to a town trial, so even bigger uh, trials when it comes to hydrogen. In tandem with that, so that's all the policy side of things, 
You've also got the production. So clearly, when you have the demand and the enabling policy landscape, what you need is the production. And at the moment, there are a, a number of projects that we're involved in here in Greater Manchester, the Trafford Low Carbon Energy Park, which is looking at producing green hydrogen, but also HiNet. So we're a consortium member, and you'll, you'll see the information about HiNet here today. And that's a, that's a significantly large-scale industrial cluster that's just got track one status and will be producing blue hydrogen in significant volumes by the end of 2025. So the next few years are exciting, certainly when it comes to hydrogen. You've got all the economic models that Bayes are consulting on at the moment as well. So we really feel like we're on a tipping point when it comes to the private investment that needs to, make, needs to happen to make hydrogen economy a, a really significant thing. And, and it's all happening in the Northwest. Thank you, Helen. And I'm not going to tell you off for going well over two minutes. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but the next person that does it is in trouble. <laughs> uh, it was remiss of me, actually. Uh, Patrick Oldcorn was um, going to come in at the, big, at the beginning. Uh, so if, if he wants to come in Sorry, for, and, and just talk a bit about it from the BEIS, uh, that'd be... Thank good. you. Um, and uh, I'm not sure what to say after um, Tim in the previous and, and Helen now have, have covered a lot of um, what's in the heat and building strategy. But it is part of um, a much broader context of papers. So Helen mentioned the 10-point plan last year. We've also got a hydrogen strategy, an industrial decarbonization strategy, a decarbonization of transport strategy. So there is a plethora of documents outlining how we are going to get to net zero in the long term and also the actions that are coming out um, in the short term. To put some of it into context, we estimate that the heat and buildings um, aspect We've allocated 6.6 .6 billion of new funding in the spending review last week um, for a range of projects targeting predominantly the poorest first and fabric first. So it is about making sure the houses are um, as energy, efficiency, uh, energy efficient as they can be because clearly the lower the energy demand, the cheaper it is to run and the, and the better it is for everybody. So there's a lot of money there for the local area delivery scheme, um, a new £950 million pound scheme um, announced in SR. Um, we've got another £800 million for social housing decarbonisation. So those of you who are from social housing uh, organisations, uh, please talk to, talk to Greater Manchester, talk to uh, colleagues, because the money is there to help you move your uh, stock into that band C uh, area that um, Tim was talking about. And that 6.6 .6 billion should lead to around 240,000 new jobs by uh, 2035. So it is a massive opportunity to level up, echoing the, the messages that the mayors were talking about this morning. Um, it is a real opportunity to transition jobs, to create new jobs, and for the academic, Academic organizations and for the uh, other skills providers to really get on board and, and deliver that. Uh, and the heat uh, side of it, the um, heat manufacturers uh, for heat pumps have said that they are going to be looking to uh, train themselves between seven and 10,000 new heat engineers a year. So there is a really big opportunity, but also a big challenge because Installing a gas boiler and installing a heat pump are very, very different skill sets. It's not uh, just a quick one-day course. Um, you do need to do quite a lot of work there. So we really need to work as a partnership at a local level to create the demand so that the businesses can see that opportunity. And that's what the heat and building strategy lays out, that pathway of opportunity for places to go take forward. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Patrick. And um, the, like you say, the opportunities available are, are massive if we get this right. Uh, the previous panelists said that the Industrial Revolution started in Manchester. As a Lancashire lad, I'd say it started in Lancashire. But wherever it started, I don't want to be controversial, and I think there's a lot we can, we can gain out of this. Um, next up, I've got Wayne Jones, to, uh, uh, is a man from Man Energy Solutions. Yeah. Sorry. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, so, um, my name is Wayne Jones. I'm on the board for MAN Energy Solutions. If I'd have sat in front of you six years ago, we were called MAN Diesel. And Rudolf Diesel invented the engine working in MAN in 1897. And one of the key things of all the topics we talk about, it's about leadership. There's so many things the world has got to do to overcome all the challenges. You heard today about concrete, 
we can tell you about the marine industry, the power industry, the oil and gas industry. There's huge amounts and strong leadership is exactly what's needed. So we changed our name. Okay, changing the name is an easy thing to do. And we changed our complete product portfolio. Six years ago, we were the largest manufacturer of diesel engines in the world. Today, we're the largest manufacturer of gas engines in the world. So huge changes. So in the, in the, in the marine industry, people talk about batteries being the future. Batteries will not solve the marine industry. Y if you've got a, a marine vessel carrying 20,000 containers, you can assure a battery will not work there. So we need to decarbonize that industry by decarbonizing the fuel. And as Helen mentioned, you know, hydrogen is one of the solutions, but we need to transition because it won't happen overnight. So we need to move into LNG and then synthetic natural gas, and then it'll be ammonia, methanol, and maybe hydrogen. So this is a massive challenge in that industry. In the power industry, we know about renewables, huge opportunity. You can't believe the amount of renewables we're gonna need to decarbonize that industry. It's a massive, massive challenge. Renewables are great, but when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine, then you've got some big challenges, yeah? So we need storage technology. And what we've already developed is the first of its kind in Manchester, it's in Carrington, liquid air energy storage. So you basically take air, you compress it, reduce the temperature, it liquefies it, you store that liquefied air for a period of time, and then you, change, you reverse the process, put it through a turbine, and you can generate energy. And that can cope with peaks, it can give around 150,000 houses power on about a 50 megawatt power station. So decentralized power is gonna be the massive thing for the country. But going back to my first statement, yeah, whether it's national, whether it's global, whether it's local, whether it's public sector, private sector, whether it's marine, power, oil and gas, the only way it will change is through strong leadership. And, and the front runners need to really step up to the mark, legislation needs to step up, them, up to the mark to make this change. Because guess what? We're already too late. To meet the global challenge of the one and a half degrees, we're already too late. So the, the big changes need to happen and they need to happen now. Thank you. Uh, next up, I've got Matt, Matt Turner. Hi there, good afternoon everybody. Uh, Matt Turner from ACOM. So we're currently working with GMCA on a project funded by Bayes, which is actually uh, looking at several pilot cities. And the aim of that project is to assist those cities in dealing with heat, decarbonization of heat, recognized to be one of the most difficult challenges as we've already heard today. Um, th there's a couple of different angles to that program. One, one is looking at the, the portfolios that, that, that uh, GMCA and the other pilot cities have under their control. So areas like the public sector stock, like schools, like the social housing stock, um, and then effectively what does that look like? What does the, the full decarbonization journey look like for that entire stock and how does that break down? So effectively taking the top level strategy that you've heard about already today, people like Andy earlier on, and then how does that break down to what needs to happen year by year? What is the cost of that? And therefore therefore you can translate that into the skills challenge that we've already heard about. One other angle there, one other intervention that, that local authorities are particularly well placed to, to do and to support is in, in the context of the, the generation and storage side of things is, is heat networks. Um, we haven't heard anything about that today, so I thought I'd, I'd sort of throw that into the equation. Um, so we're looking at um, the opportunities in Greater Manchester and in the other cities as well about how do we get heat networks up to a significant scale um, many of the, many of the uh, research work that's been done by the Committee on Climate Change and Bayes themselves has shown that heat networks could potentially and potentially need to uh, get to a kind of market share, as it were, in, in the heat market of, of about 20%. So heat network effectively, for those of you that, that maybe not, may not know the terminology, is where you have uh, communal heating systems, city-wide heating systems. At the moment, they, they provide about 2%, 2 3% of, of the heat in the UK. We're hoping to get them up to potentially around 20%. Um, in, in the uh, new world of, of, of lower carbon uh, centralized systems, we're looking at opportunities for low carbon heat sources. And just picking up on something that Andy mentioned this morning, the Northwest is well placed because you do have access to some of those, um, some of those opportunities. So one thing that's being looked at in Oldham, there's a project in Oldham looking at the moment at mine water heat opportunities. So there's very flooded mines uh, using effectively the, the industrial heritage of the Northwest, um, accessing those and using the heat available in those. 
Another, another project um, that we'll be looking at shortly is, is the use of river, um, rivers and using the heat available from rivers. Again, harking back to the time in many of, these, many of the locations we're looking at, they, they, those rivers used to be used as major power sources for some of the mills that are still, still alongside them. Um, obviously, other conversations with potentially with um, other partners in the, in the area, um, looking at wastewater, sewage as, as heat sources as well. So they are significant opportunities to provide uh, local, locally specific heat generation um, and to provide a lower cost. Where, where heat networks work well, effectively what they can do is they can provide lower cost, lower carbon heating solutions. The big change that's happened in recent years as a result of some of the policy and strategy that's coming from Bayes is that business as usual in terms of just having leaky buildings with gas boilers doesn't exist. So we, we have to change. And we're now at a point where, as you're, hear, as you're hearing already, there's, there's a choice of pathways. Do, do, we go, do we go heat pumps? Do we go hydrogen? Do we go uh, heat networks? To some extent, we kind of have to pick all three. And then what, what we'll find over time is we have, we have some good confidence of what works where well to some extent now. And as those, as those technologies develop, we'll, we'll find that the, everything will find its place as we go through. But we have to move now on all three of those effectively. We have to move quite quickly. So yeah, we're, we're hoping that our program helps provide GMCA with, with some of those projects, turning, again, like I say, the, the strategy into deliverable projects that can start to get these things moving. And, and the quicker we have large-scale projects delivering mass rollouts of, as you heard before, retrofit in buildings, heat pumps, large-scale, significant heat networks, then we'll get more investment into those, into those sectors and, and we'll, we'll hopefully, from an optimistic spin, we'll see change happen quite quickly. Uh, one last thing to say about the heat network piece is that there's a bit of consultation at the moment around the potential for, for zoning around heat networks, which effectively will allow you, if you could prove that the heat network is, is the lowest cost, lowest carbon way to, to get buildings off gas, um, then that would potentially give local authorities the, the power to um, support or encourage or enforce connection of, the, of, of particular buildings to connect onto those heat networks, would give a, which would give a big shift in, in, in the uptake of those and would copy effectively what we've seen happen um, in previous years in the continent, which, which have a much greater penetration of, of heat networks um, into, that, into that market. Thank you very much. And an important point there about the moving on some of these things now. It's not um, a VHS versus Betamax argument of the 1980s. Uh, th th these things will find their own place. Um, and last but not least, Johnny. Thanks, Sean. Um, I want to pick up on two words that we've probably all heard quite a lot this morning. Why is this a particularly exciting time? Uh, and also action, um, something that we've, we've talked about a lot this morning. So why, why is now a particularly exciting time for the energy industry and particularly the electricity industry. Go back 10 years ago, only 7% of the electricity in the UK came from renewables. That was 43% last year. You look at PV, 1% of that renewable mix was from PV in 2010. That's up to 28% in 2020. So those, those numbers give you a sense of how quickly the energy industry has changed just in the last 10 years. And that was without, I would argue, the real urgency that we've now got in front of us in the form of things like IPCC reports. So it's an exciting time, it's a fast moving time, um, and it's a really interesting time to be in the energy industry. Let me just talk briefly about action for, for my next minute. So what are we doing as electricity Northwest to be part of that, that rapid transition of the energy system? We, we do two main things to lead the Northwest to net zero. Firstly, we make sure that the network has got the capacity that our customers need. So we estimate that there will be between two and two and a half times more electricity needed in 2050 than there is today. And that's for things like the three million electric vehicles we'll have on our roads by 2050. It's for things like the 400,000 heat pumps we'll have across the region. And it's also to support the, the doubling in the amount of local renewable energy uh, generation that we'll see on the network over the next 20 years. So that's the first thing that we've got to do as a, as a DNO is we've got to make sure that the network has got the capacity that our customers need. Um, that's a non-negotiable thing that Ofgem make sure that we and other DNOs across the country do. The second thing that we do is the, is the other side of that coin really is we've got a very good understanding of what is and what isn't happening 
in the energy system across the Northwest. And where we started in 2019 to take a much more proactive role in helping businesses and domestic customers to get on their net zero journey. So we've been starting to get into that space for the last two years and we'll be expanding the support that we provide from next year. And if I can leave you with three particular, te particular technologies to have in mind for this session, but to take away with you after today, the three things we really push with our business customers is energy efficiency, PV and electric vehicles. You've got three technologies or three interventions there where you will already see mature technologies and a really good return on investment. So if, if nothing else from today, please do take away those three practical actions that we can all take today. Thank you very much. So just a quick question. I think we've got enough probably to get through the panel up with one question. Um, and I'm going to go with local energy generation. So. What are the socio-economic benefits of more local energy generation and how can we capture these? And I'll go in reverse order this time. I'll start at this end and I'll move that way. So, Johnny. Great. Uh, pa Patrick's already touched on this. So, 10-point um, plan for a green industrial revolution talks about another 250,000 jobs by 2030 on top of the 460,000 you've already got in low carbon industries across the UK. So, for me, this is very, very much an agenda which is driven by two things, doing the right thing and getting to the 1.5 degree goal, which I'll, I'll disagree with Wayne, I haven't given up on 1.5 degrees yet. Um, but secondly, this is absolutely about creating jobs, high quality, well paid jobs for the people of the Northwest. Thank you. I'll, I'll ask you a different one then, but at least we get a, bit, a variety. Uh, so we've heard that decarbonizing heat is going to be a real challenge for the region. How can local energy generation and storage help to resolve this? Uh, well, it's got a really big part to play. I think we, we talk about that we have an energy mix at the moment. Um, we're going to have an energy mix in the future. It will just look different. Um, so the, you mentioned the VHS versus Betamax. It's it, I've heard it a couple of times recently. For us, this is gas and electricity and nuclear and uh, local generation all playing their part in, in order to provide the right solution in the right setting. It's not a one-size-fits-all, I think we've heard that already. Decarbonisation will be delivered locally and it will look different depending on where you are in the region and the role that hydrogen plays in that will be very different depending on where you are in the region and your proximity to the clusters and generation. So for us, it, it, it's all part of everything working together, but clearly local generation, whether it's electricity or whether it's hydrogen, has a really important role to play. Thank you. Um, move, now, moving from gas as the primary heat source to low carbon uh, alternatives will be key. What measures are needed to expedite this? I probably should have asked you that one, but I, I take it away. <laughs> yeah, I wish I'd have got Helen's question. Um, yeah, I mean, it, listen, it, for me, it's still about this big picture thing. And, that, you know, that, that it's, it's all well and good talking about one part of the, um, of the puzzle, but there's a life cycle scenario here, and the supply chains are going to be massively important to us, there's no doubt. You know, the, the car industry is talking about batteries, that's great, but if you're producing batteries in a non-carbon friendly way, then what's the point of producing the battery in the first place? So, for me, the supply chains are going to be the massive thing in this change. Yeah, and, and let's say that there's... There's a lot of stuff, supply chain stuff. I mean, the environment bill, which keeps going round and round, getting kicked about. There's a lot of stuff in there that we really need to be getting on with as well. Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll see which one I haven't asked. Could you, will we be able to generate enough energy locally to meet our needs? Have I already asked that one? I don't think I did. Um, <laughs> that's, a that's a tough one. Um, I think the idea is obviously the, the, way, the way to get to, I, I don't think that is probably the end result. The end result is probably going to be a uh, national, maybe the international um, answer to that question. But I think what, what, what you can do locally is try to generate more and obviously use less. And just like, ob an obvious answer there. And I think, as, as you've heard on this session and obviously the previous session as well, there's a huge amount that can be done in terms of demand reduction. Patrick mentioned that as well. And actually, coming back onto the, the previous question, in terms of you know, trying to make, and, and linking back to what Andy was saying earlier on about getting a just transition, trying to get to a point where you know, we, we have a, a future that is, is better than now, in, in both in terms of the, the carbon emissions associated with the energy we use and the costs associated with it as well. We, we, we do use energy quite wastefully at the moment. So 
it, it should be hopefully the case that we can make demand reductions that offset the higher costs that we have to do in the short term to get some of these new technologies in. And then we can see, if we look into the future, longer term, some of these technologies should get better. We've got a bit of a hump to get over, um, but we do need to kind of make big investments now in, in both demand reduction and generation. Um, and then we'll see where we are when we get to, the, get to that point as to how much of that ends up being local and how much that ends up being sort of national infrastructure. But I do, I'm confident that the other side of the hump of the slightly unknown, slightly higher cost, the, the change as it were, is a, better, is a better future where we do get lower carbon and lower cost energy for everybody. Uh, and Patrick, the showstopper question for you is, could you conclude with one key point that, um, that you want to take the, the audience to take away with them? Well, um, so, I mean, I think the, the big thing is that all of these things work together. So, so when you think about a house with a battery and a car and a heat pump or, a, you know, all of these things will work together in the future and people will have to make choices about those. So it's about people. It's not going to happen to you. It's going to happen because of you and because of your choices. And so the one thing I'd say is, get involved, get educated, work with people who know, your community groups, your local authority, your energy suppliers, everybody has a part to play in the education. But it is about education and choice. And if we don't get that bit right, then we're gonna really struggle. Absolutely, totally agree. Okay, so all it remains for me now is to thank everyone for that. I think it was a really interesting session. A lot of stuff to do, I'm sure we all agree. But I'm, I'm sure we can get there. I'm, I'm going with Johnny on the one and a half degrees. I'm, I've got to be glass half full, even if I've got my doubts as well. So thanks, everyone. Thank you, Sean. Uh, so we've, we've covered a huge amount of territory. Thanks again to our speakers. We've covered a huge amount of territory already today. Uh, and we're going to finish with our last panel session before lunch, uh, where we figure out how some of this all meshes together into what some people call smart energy systems. So I'd like to invite our final panel uh, for the main session for today onto the stage, moderated by Andy Hume from the Northwest Business Leadership Team. Over to you, Andy. Okay, uh, thank you everybody, and welcome to this set of lightning talks on smart energy systems for a smart energy planet. As you heard, my name's Andy Hume, I'm Head of Innovation and Growth at the Northwest Business Leadership Team. The BLT was formed 30 years ago by a group of leaders who recognised the need for business to step up to work with public sector partners to make a difference. For this set of talks, our speakers, who I'll introduce uh, in turn shortly, are considering the opportunities and challenges we face as we decarbonize and decentralize our energy system. And the relationship between buildings, transport, and energy infrastructure becomes ever more complex and inter-reliant. In planning for net zero, we need to understand how to create an energy system which is smart, resilient, and fit for the future. For instance, as we increasingly move towards smart homes and buildings, how do we drive forward the opportunity to link in smart energy? As we move to increasingly localize and decarbonize sources of heat and power, what further planning and innovation do we need in order to accurately predict and deliver future energy supply and demand? How might innovation deliver the remaining tools that we need to create a smart energy planet at a price point that consumers can afford? As you've heard today and during COP26, Greater Manchester has set an ambition to remove 1 million tonnes of carbon from the city region by 2024. That's a big ambition for what's a relatively short space of time, and one where projects will need to relate to one another and to existing systems in order to deliver maximum impact. So, we have four great speakers, as I say, and I'm certain you've turned up to listen to them rather than to me. So, without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, Jenny Lyon, 
who's Senior Project Manager at the Energy Systems Catapult, where she's worked since 2016. Jenny's career has seen her deliver a range of sustainability projects in both the public and private sector, including development of large-scale solar farm projects. Jenny. Thanks very much for the intro, Andy. So I'd like to say a little bit today about local area energy planning and how at Energy Systems Catapult we feel that that can provide a really firm foundation for developing smart energy systems and particularly smart local energy systems. Um, I think in the room today we are all in agreement about the scale of the challenge in front of us and, it, and it's really good to see how many local places ac across the northwest and, and indeed across the country have acknowledged that. We know that 75% or more of local authorities have declared climate emergencies now and many, such as Greater Manchester, have indeed set themselves targets well ahead of the national 2050 target, the 2038 here in Greater Manchester, for example. So that's a really great and strong ambition, but there's a big question for me about how. Um, do all of those places really have a clear plan of how they're going to achieve those goals across their places in a way that's coherent and in a way that works for all of the people who, and businesses in that area? We need to understand what technologies uh, are needed in which places, in which buildings. Uh, we need to think about the timing of that, and we need to think about the impact on energy infrastructure. Uh, we think that local area energy planning is a way of putting together a coherent and data-driven answer to those questions. And it takes account of the fact that each place, as for example, Helen was saying earlier, is unique and has its own situation. The geographies are different, some places are rural, some are more urban. Everywhere has a different mix of buildings, a different set of pipes and wires already in the ground. And also, as we heard a little earlier, different resources to draw on in terms of local generation. So everywhere needs a, a plan that's spoke to that. There isn't uh, a one-size-fits-all answer. We think that if we build a data-driven foundation for a plan and work in collaboration with different stakeholders, it's possible to come up with the answers to some of those questions so that all of the stakeholders in an area can work together with a coherent view towards decarbonizing the local energy system. And importantly, we think that that needs to be a whole systems approach. So uh, Andy mentioned just now that we're thinking here not just about buildings and how you decarbonize heating and energy use in buildings, but also the energy infrastructure, the networks, and transport as well, which is increasingly going to be drawing directly on our, our energy grids. So we need to look at all of those together and make sure that if we kind of pull on a string in one part of the network, we're not going to have an adverse impact that we aren't expecting elsewhere. If we can do that and come up with the optimum solutions for an area, then that gives an informed baseline for everybody with an area to work towards the changes that we need. So that can be a foundation for investment in new opportunities. It can give a bit of guidance for local residents about how they might go about decarbonizing their homes. And it can provide opportunities for further innovation. So at Energy Systems Catapult, our mission is all about innovation in energy systems, and particularly about how businesses can build on that opportunity. So we hope that with the, the foundation and the evidence base coming from a local area energy plan, business kids can target the opportunities to develop their business plans and to build new business cases uh, in particular areas. And that's something that we're working with Greater Manchester on at the moment, developing local area energy plans across all 10 districts, trying to provide that coherent business case for changing the energy system for the better in the area. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that, Jenny. Next, I'm delighted to welcome Dave Roberts, who's Commercial Director at EA Technology, based at Capenhurst near Chester. EA specializes in asset management solutions for owners and operators of electrical assets and marked its 55th anniversary this year. So Dave spent eight years with Scottish Power after completing his apprenticeship before joining EA in 2009. And the focus of Dave's lightning talk is linking energy infrastructure to building and transport infrastructure and the investment needed to do this. Dave. Okay, thanks Andy. I think a lot of the points that have been talked about already today is really just showing how connected and integrated a lot of our energy system is becoming. And just to take a point that Johnny was talking about from Electricity Northwest, in the last decade, we've seen a significant change in the way that the electricity has changed from its generation source um, to decarbonize. And we expect that to continue further over the, the next decade and beyond. 
But actually one of the big changes we're going to see in this decade is about the role of us as consumers and the role of us as we start to change our behavior in the way that we, the vehicles we drive, the way we heat our homes, the way we decarbonize our businesses. And ultimately, those two pressures, the generation on one end and the demand changes on the other, we must also consider there's something happening in the middle. And that really is how the network needs to cope with all of this in order to support that and to, to work for the long term. It's a really interesting point that's worth noting that in many cities across the world, the infrastructure that powers the economy is the age of many of the buildings. So in and around Manchester and many other cities, you might have networks that are 100 years old, 100 years old. And over the next 10 years, we're going to radically change how they operate. We're going to be pulling on them in different ways. And that really leads us to two main things. The first one is the ability to model how that might predict and how that might change. So working out which of those electricity networks might need to be invested in, to be upgraded, which ones we might need different solutions in order to utilize the network in a more coherent way to, to work with the different needs at the, the other end. And the second point is once you've modeled those networks, really making sure we're using those to the best of our ability because it's not in any of our interests to have to dig up the streets in order to allow us to all decarbonize, to allow us to drive electric vehicles or to be able to install heat pumps. So making sure that the network can operate in a sufficiently quick and agile way to, to support that transition. So the second point from me is around monitoring and the need for monitoring the existing system so that we can use everything and every ounce of the existing capacity um, to, to make sure that we, we aren't over-investing in the system into the future. The third point I'd like to play in is one that we have heard about, and it's one of local leadership and about business leadership. And I think in all of this, it's really important to recognize that we as businesses have a role to play. It is about identifying and looking inwards on ourselves about what we can do and how we can then communicate outwards to other organizations. So one specific, we've taken our 1950s building to basically retrofit it and decarbonize. Look at the sort of sequencing of the activity that needs to get done in a more holistic way. And then we're sharing the journey that we've been doing um, out with, uh, with external parties. Because we recognize that if we're going to be a player in this societal change, we need to be educating others. Brilliant. Thanks, Dave. Excuse me. <coughs> Next up, I'm pleased to introduce Stephen Goldspring, who's head of business development at Siemens Smart Infrastructure. Stephen spent all of his career today at Stevens, at uh, Siemens, I believe, um, and is an electrical engineer by trade. SSI provides a range of smart building and electrification products, systems, solutions, and services. For his talk, Stephen is focusing on citywide planning and technology innovations to deliver smart energy networks. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. So I think I'll start with what we're trying to achieve. And for me, that is moving towards clean, green, increasingly electric and connected energy systems and energy networks. And there's a lot already happening. You've heard already about the large scale decarbonization and decentralization of the power system. But it's not always positive. Um, we did a study within Siemens during COVID when lots of businesses were in lockdown and people were working from home. And globally, on average, commercial buildings, only re on, they were still using 86% of their energy needs when they were sitting largely empty. And quite frankly, that's probably not good enough if we're going to realize some of our targets. But there's an awful lot more positive happening. You know, and, uh, imagine in the short term where we have an accelerated rollout of electric vehicles. We have smart buildings within our cities, and we've accelerated the rollout of, of heat pumps. That's going to have a huge impact on electricity networks and energy networks themselves. And um, you know, more and more, the smart energy networks are going to interface with smart infrastructure, smart buildings. So that complexity and that interoperability absolutely needs whole systems planning. It needs to take a much larger perspective on how we're going to make all of that, make all of that work. 
And there's more that needs to be done as well to facilitate this. Uh, I'm sure the government will continue to drive policy and regulation in the right way. You've already heard we do need more local decision making. We need to be able to implement smart energy networks and make those decisions at a local level. We need to really push for more consumer engagement. Again, you've heard just how important individually we'll, we will all play a role in getting to where we want to be. Uh, and flexibility, driving the markets in a different way to make sure that actually we release the flexibility within our networks is also going to be really, really critical. An important point is to have a plan, have a roadmap of where you want to be, but don't make it rigid. It needs to be adaptable because we will see technologies maturing and different business models um, coming through as we move forwards. And as a global technology company, one thing we're urging people to do and companies to do is act now. We have seven years until the carbon budget for one and a half degrees Celsius is exhausted. So we need to act now. And the reason I say that is that we don't need to wait for the next big thing. There's an awful lot of technology that we can deploy today that can have a huge benefit. And about 75% of carbon emissions are generated within a number of sectors where, where Siemens are already playing a very proactive part in helping those sectors to decarbonize. So we can do this now and we can start it now. And for me, sustainability and sustainable infrastructure, it goes hand in hand with digitalization. And this is where things like digital twins really, really come into their own. Because the digital twin will allow you to really model your whole city. It will allow you to make decisions and manage your investments and your assets far better. So digital twins are inevitably going to be a really important part of that city-wide city um, landscape, really, that planning landscape. And to summarize, really what we're trying to do is digitalize the heck out of infrastructure so that actually we can start to utilize and release capacity in all of those assets across a city. Um, an important one that we see is, is the need for more partnerships and collaboration. And when we're dealing with a local authority, it can be quite complex because of the large number of stakeholders. And we really um, exciting and innovative energy projects using IoT and classic energy, energy equipment. And to be fair, we haven't really scaled them up in the way that we would expect to. And that is sometimes down to the complexity of the, the stakeholders that are involved. We have other examples. For example, we're working with University of Birmingham at the moment, and we've entered, in, entered into a 10-year partnership to deploy an IoT and Energy Services Bureau. And we've actually come to that decision quite quickly because it's a much simpler set of stakeholders. But partnerships and collaboration are absolutely critical. Innovation is required, and I would say where we need to focus innovation is more around um, intelligence and less about hardware. A lot of the hardware is already on that maturity um, trajectory, whereas data and intelligence is really, really important. That's where the innovation sits. So it, it's, in 2020, I think there were about 18 billion non-domestic Internet of Things devices around the UK. By 2030, that'll be about 100 billion. So imagine the data that we can get from those devices that's going to help to drive different business models. And, and for me, that continued digitalization is where the innovation will lie. And, and just watch how much um, potential and how much value and efficiency is unlocked when we start to realize the, the data side of things. So in summary for me, cities do need that whole system-wide planning approach. It is a complex structure and a complex system. And it needs that real, real careful planning. And the interoperability between multiple stakeholders is ever so important. And it, it, it's, it's a challenging journey. And uh, you know, we'll need some course correction along the way. But I think it's a journey that we're all up for. And uh, there's no reason why we can't start now. Brilliant. Thank you, Stephen. Our final contributor for this session is Rachel Shawnee, Scottish Power Manweb's stakeholder energy stakeholder engagement manager, sorry Rachel, for SP Energy Networks. Rachel spent over 30 years working on the design, operation and construction of large energy infrastructure projects and for the last decade 
She's also helped connect producers of renewable generation with the SP Energy Networks distribution grid. Just as a bit of a sense of scale, a bit of a, a fact check as I was doing my background, SP owns and operates over 40,000 kilometers of overhead lines, 65,000 kilometers of underground cables, and over 30,000 substations. That's a lot of kit across its network, which covers central and southern Scotland, North Wales, Merseyside, Cheshire, and North Shropshire. Rachel is going to talk about smart distribution networks. Thank, thanks, Andy. And um, I would just like to say thank you to the panel, because it's great to be on a panel where everyone has already given my messages and my work here is done. <laughs> so that's wonderful. And also to Helen and Johnny in the session before as well, because all I have to do is say I agree with everybody else. So as Andy said, um, I'm the um, SP ManWeb Stakeholder Engagement Manager, so I look after the um, um, stakeholders in the Liverpool City region, Cheshire and Warrington, North and Mid Wales area. And as everyone said already, we're already preparing for net zero. Electricity networks ourselves and Electricity Northwest are already at the moment uh, negotiating with our regulator, Ofgem, for our funding for the next five year period between 2023 and 2028. And effectively, that's the money that we will get to invest in our network. And as Dave mentioned earlier, our, some parts of our network are already up to 100 years old, but the majority of it was built before we were privatized back in 1990. So it's an old network. And what we're trying to do now is keep it going as long as possible without having to do a lot more investment on it. Because at the end of the day, more investment needs, means more energy costs for our customers. So it doesn't matter who you pay your electricity bill to, who you buy your electricity from. If you live in our area, then 15, 16% of your bill comes to us to keep the lights on effectively. And what we're trying to do is keep the lights on in an, in an era where more people are more and more reliant on electricity. At the moment, if, if you have a power cut and you um, wake up in the morning without your alarm clock and you're a little bit late for work, then you might get told off by your boss, but it's not the end of the world. In the future, when you're more reliant on charging your electric vehicle to get to work, and more importantly, heating your home through electricity, then it really does make more of a difference if the lights are no longer kept on. So we're really busy working on that, and we know we need to invest in our network. We've predict predicted on our network in the Liverpool City region, Cheshire and Warrington, and the North Wales area, we pre predicted approximately 500,000 electric vehicles within our patch that we need to charge, either in the workplace or at home or en route as people are traveling around. And we're predicting about 330,000 heat pumps onto our network. We've got rural areas in our network, and we've also got gas grid networks, and we're already working with Caden on how we do the whole system approach for either hydrogen or hybrid heating for those homes. And to be perfectly honest, we're also looking at hydrogen transport as well, because we're expecting the HDV vehicles and the buses and that sort of thing to go to hydrogen. And to a little bit, we need that, because if they all go electric, then we need to invest more in our network. So it, it really, truly is the whole system approach. We're technology agnostic. It doesn't matter which technology people go to use going forwards. Everybody will need electricity to keep that safe and secure and to keep your home safe and secure. So that's the bit that we're working on. And we know we need to invest. We don't want to dig up every single street, down every single um, town to be able to prepare for heat pumps and electric vehicles. And we don't want to have to build big overhead lines and substations in every single town to be able to accommodate all this additional demand. We're going to have to do some of that, but the more that we can use our existing network and get more out of our existing network before we have to put more copper in the ground, more substations, that sort of thing, that's better for us. So we're working with technologies and um, other businesses like Siemens, like EA Technology, to try and get more visibility and more monitoring onto our network. Because you're quite right, the data side of things is absolutely critical to us, so that the more that we can understand exactly 
actually what this technology has an effect on our network, we can then know how much of it we can accommodate before we need to invest more. So the visibility side and the monitoring side of our network is absolutely crucial to us. And Dave said something earlier about, you know, we're already working with local businesses and we're already working in partnership with local government and the local um, businesses in the area. And for our industrial and commercial customers, we've been working for a number of years now on preparing for net zero. But our domestic customer base really isn't necessarily up to speed at the moment about what is coming their way. So that's why I see COP and these sorts of exam events as being critical to be able to talk to our domestic customer base. We really want to start working with more than just the industrial commercial customers that we currently work with. So the more of these sorts of events to get people thinking about what they want to do, how do they want to heat their home going forwards, how do they want to get to work, how do they want to travel around their area. It doesn't matter if you don't go electric, if you decide hydrogen is the way for you, then we still need to help you accommodate what you need on our network. So pretty much we all need to work together and we all are um, part of this journey together. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Rachel. Um, we've just got time for one very quick question. It's the same question to everybody on the panel. Um, I mentioned in my intro the need for different parts of the energy system to talk to one another. Who do you think should ultimately be responsible for making that work? And we'll start it. The million dollar question. I, th I think we probably all use the word whole system in, in what we've said today. And, and really, you, you can't say that one organisation is solely responsible for the change that's needed because everything has to work together. But I think for me, there's a really strong and central role for, for local authorities to play in convening, in guiding, in putting together plans which take account of the voices of all of the people in the local area, so the residents and the businesses, and making sure there's a kind of a democratic angle to the plan for the future, um, so that all of the other stakeholders have somewhere to turn and to coordinate through. I think it's a, a really good question, and I do agree with Jenny's point as well. I, I think a lot, certainly what we've heard and what we're hearing and seeing in society is there is no silver bullet here. There's no one answer and no one party I think is going to take responsibility and, and needs to take responsibility actually for this. Ultimately, what we actually need is a very, very clear direction of travel so that we're very, very clear as to what the actions are, what we're likely to see, and then I'll actually allow the supply chains and the, the other parties all associated with the sectors to, to move in the same direction. I think the key point of this is pace, because this is going to happen at a far greater pace, and it should happen at a far greater pace than we've ever seen before. So that clarity of vision, that clarity of purpose, that clarity of goal needs to be short term, it needs to be driven, it needs to be focused, and we need to look at the sort of no regrets activity that are going to move us faster. Um, I'll take a slightly different tack. I'll say it's individuals. Everyone as an individual has a role to play in helping us to get to net zero. And, and that's whether you're at home, where you are at work, how you get to work. I honestly believe it's down to us as individuals. I'm going to say everybody. It's everybody's responsibility. It's UK government, it's local government, and it's local authorities, it's local businesses. If you're um, an employer in the area, you have a responsibility, but also every single domestic customer can do something about this as well. Um, I really liked what the, one of the other panel members was saying. I think it might have been Johnny from Electricity Northwest. It's really simple. If everybody uses less electricity, there will be more capacity on our network for when people start needing to charge electric vehicles and using heat pumps. So if everybody switches every light off and switches the red box off for standby on the television every night, th there are some really simple things that people can start to do to get involved in this. But I think, to be perfectly honest, we all need to work together and everybody has a role and that's where I think. Um, we're going to actually get something by communicating more and actually helping each other. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so that brings the session to, to a close. I mean, just a couple of concluding thoughts from me, if I can. Um, I think it's been really interesting hearing about the challenge of the uniqueness of different places in bringing about this sort of change. Actually, also, in, just as we've touched on here, that the role of 
consumers and communities as part of that system as well. I think sometimes we talk about things out, out with the, the people that are actually using the end user. Um, digitalization data um, provides a real opportunity to innovate and help us see what, that's, what the system might look like without actually having to invest too much money up front to do it because um, it's going to cost a lot, so let's just try and do it once. Um, and I think finally just that point around the challenge of, of people stepping up to lead and work together to, to make this happen. So brilliant. So if you can join me in thanking our speakers. Thanks very much, Andy. Right, that brings us to the end of our final panel session. And we now, one thing we haven't touched on today is what we eat and how we make that more sustainable. And so we now have 30 minutes for a low carbon lunch provided by Voodoo Rays. For those of you who recognize that being a guy called Gerald Song, uh, you're in the same camp as me. Um, we then have uh, our smart talk session, which is in the plant room. Uh, which is the other end of the building. And that starts, at, we're going to be starting that at 2 o'clock. So the smart talks are in the plant room at the other end. We've got four great talks after lunch. It just leaves me to say thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to Escape to Freight Island. Uh, and thank you once again to all our speakers who've done a great job today. Thank you very much indeed. Greater Manchester is the first city region in the UK to adopt an accelerated carbon reduction plan over the next five years. We're setting the standard for others to follow. Working with the government, we want to bring a London-style integrated public transport system to Greater Manchester, which will help us remove a million tonnes of carbon from the Greater Manchester economy over the next three years, achieving our ambitious science-based goal of a net zero Greater Manchester by 2038, 12 years ahead of the rest of the UK, will require everyone here to play their part. We're spending £80 million this year on reducing the carbon impact from the public buildings, but also looking at our 1.2 million homes and how we can retrofit those. You know, the opportunities that the facilities like Energy House 1 and Energy House 2 provide give us that real opportunity to innovate much more quickly and bring things to the market. So the Energy Innovation Agency is a really exciting development because it's bringing together partners from across the city. We're also trying to deliver more low carbon renewable energy here within the city. Now the Fuel Cell Centre is a 4.1 million pound research and innovation centre. We're very focused on green hydrogen, so we're working in various different projects on electrolyzers, which ultimately will help us generate lots and lots of green hydrogen, which will be part of our UK-wide net zero plans. We've got our community forest called City of Trees, with their aim of planting a tree literally for every man, woman and child in the city region. Mayfield was conceived in 2016 to redevelop 25 acres of land right in the heart of the city centre. It sits at the heart of a seven acre park. So the B network is, it will eventually comprise 1,800 miles of fully connected cycling and walking routes across the city region. It's going to cost £1.5 billion. It's a perfect option to tackle health, uh, inequality and of course pollution. The Green Revolution will help us reduce inequalities and we want the government to back our ambitions to tackle climate change through a new Greater Manchester levelling up deal.
Greater Manchester is the first city region in the UK to adopt an accelerated carbon reduction plan over the next five years. We're setting the standard for others to follow. Working with the government, we want to bring a London-style integrated public transport system to Greater Manchester, which will help us remove a million tonnes of carbon from the Greater Manchester economy over the next three years, achieving our ambitious science-based goal of a net zero Greater Manchester by 2038, 12 years ahead of the rest of the UK, will require everyone here to play their part. We're spending £80 million this year on reducing the carbon impact from the public buildings, but also looking at our 1.2 million homes and how we can retrofit those. You know, the opportunities that the facilities like Energy House 1 and Energy House 2 provide give us that real opportunity to innovate much more quickly and bring things to the market. So the Energy Innovation Agency is really exciting development because it's bringing together partners from across the city. We're also trying to deliver more low carbon renewable energy here within the city. Now the Fuel Cell Centre is a £4.1 million research and innovation centre. We're very focused on green hydrogen, so we're working in various different projects on electrolyzers, which ultimately will help us generate lots and lots of green hydrogen, which will be part of our UK-wide net zero plans. We've got our community forest called City of Trees, with their aim of planting a tree literally for every man, woman and child in the city region. Mayfield was conceived in 2016 to redevelop 25 acres of land right in the heart of the city centre. It sits at the heart of a seven acre park. So the B network is, it will eventually comprise 1,800 miles of fully connected cycling and walking routes across the city region. It's going to cost £1.5 billion. Pounds. It's a perfect option to tackle health, uh, inequality and of course pollution. The Green Revolution will help us reduce inequalities and we want the government to back our ambitions to tackle climate change through a new Greater Manchester levelling up deal.